welcome everybody out to Pines Dome. Big meeting tonight. We'll go ahead and get started. I've asked uh, Commissioner Ernst to lead us in the Pledge of Allegiance. If they'll so please rise. Please rise. Say the Pledge of Allegiance with me. The Pledge of Allegiance to the flag of the United States of America and to the Republic for which it stands, one nation under God, indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. Thank you. Um, our first item of business is the uh, approval of the minutes from our last meeting, which was the August 7th meeting. Uh, anybody that can make a motion on that? I move that we have approved the minutes of August. I have a motion. Do I have a second? Second. Motion is second. All in favor? Aye. 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 I show that pass unanimously. I'll let those be entered in. Um, the first item of business is an annexation. This is uh, not a public hearing. Some of the others are. This one is not. Um, I guess we'll hear from staff first. Dave, is that you? Mr. Chairman, yes, sir, it is me. subject property in this case is about 50 acres located near the Salem Benjamin interchange um, the property incidentally these are some of the the things that we would focus on as staff the property is in the city's annexation policy it's currently within our growth boundary and the applicants are proposing rural residential zoning um, at present, the property is pretty well situated for us to be able to provide services. The big one there is is sewer service. Typically, that's the most difficult utility to deliver in areas that aren't uh, already developed to some extent. Spanish Fork City invested quite a bit of money uh, just in the, within the past few years to build a, a sewer lift station, uh, which is essentially how um, that particular utility would be provided all the way to I-15. It also makes it easier to deliver water and perhaps even power to the subject property. So in a nutshell, as I go through things here, just to allow people to be a little bit more familiar with the actual site, uh, because we believe that utility service can be provided to the subject properties because what the applicants are proposing by way of zoning right now, which essentially is just a placeholder for zoning that would be assigned to the property in the future when there's an actual development proposal to review. Um, we're very comfortable with that approach of having essentially an agricultural zone assigned to the property now. Um, and uh, I, I think I didn't mention this a second time through, but the city's planned to have these properties annexed. That's why it's, again, part of the annexation policy and part of the growth boundary. So for those reasons, we're comfortable recommending that the annexation be approved. There are a couple of things that uh, I'll touch on by way of steps that we think need to happen before the council acts on the proposal. But I appreciate Mr. Bunker kind of kind of um, flipping through some images that we have here of the subject property. And Ian, I'm going to ask you to go back to the first one which I think uh, gives a better point of reference than what I mentioned a minute ago with the, the aerial that we had. What we're seeing here is the intersection of Mount Lofer Parkway, which you can't quite see really well with this image, but this is state route, I think it's 164. We call it 8,000 South. So the interchange is just a little bit further to the left off of this image to the west and um, we're looking at the lands that are in the proposed annexation from its southeast corner looking northwest um, so you can see what what eventually is going to be a very prominent intersection is right at the southeast corner of the proposed annexation 
And one of the things that we feel needs uh, some additional work is the planning for the future expansion of Mount Lofer Parkway as it proceeds from this intersection, which is right now where it ends, to the north, um, we anticipate, and maybe more importantly, Utah County, who owns and is responsible for Mount Lofer Parkway. They're planning for the road to proceed to the north, and there are two homes. Ian, maybe if you can go now through the other images. So this is just another image shown a little bit further to the north. From this image here, you can see one home that's that's on the left side of the road there, and another one uh, just beyond the, uh, the cultivated fields. Yeah, right there on the right or east side of the road. The one on um, the left would be included in this annexation? The one on the left is included in the annexation. The one on the right is not. And we anticipate, and you can't quite see, or at least it doesn't show up really well, but I-15 is, is in this image. Um, right along there again. Thanks, Ian. Um, that between these two homes, as Mount Lofer Parkway is developed in the future, it will take a gradual swing, might say it will sloop uh, to the west to cross I-15 perpendicularly before it turns back to go due north on the other side of I-15 to tie into the area that'll be in proximity to a new uh, Center Street interchange in Spanish Fork. Now, will, the, will it connect yeah. with the road that Leland Mills is on? No. It would on the, uh, on the west side of I-15 okay. is how I look at it, or 9th south when it That's crosses it I-15. Oh, yeah, okay. but not on the east side. No. Um, does that make sense? Sort of cross I-15 before it gets to 9th south. Now, um, we appreciate the applicants uh, expressing a willingness to work with us to make sure that we have a plan to secure this right of way. Um, so a couple of things need to happen in order for us to, to have that in place. Um, Utah County needs to provide an alignment for the road. I think we have something that is, um, is probably pretty close to a final, um, I'll say design. I think engineers probably would want me to s describe it differently, but design for where the road would go, how wide it would be, and that type of a thing. It would probably still be a little bit uh, subject to future modifications. Um, so uh, we anticipate being able to get something like that from Utah County in the next maybe week or weeks. And then we look for the applicants to enter into an annexation agreement that would, in one way or another, provide for that uh, needed right of way to be made available either to Spanish Fork City or to Utah County, something like that. So there are details on, again, planning for the future of Mount Lofer Parkway that we need to work through. Um, there's another issue relative to the configuration of the annexation and uh, how it creates uh, an odd configuration that requires the county commission and incidentally, Spanish Fork City Council's approval um, in order for that, uh, in order for the annexation ultimately to be approved. Um, we think the applicants are well on their way to having that issue addressed. Um, and with that tonight, uh, we do uh, hope that the Planning Commission will consider recommending that the proposed annexation be approved and that rural residential zoning be assigned at the time of annexation. Does anybody have any questions about that or anything else? Are all of the affected landowners in favor of the annexation and the zoning, zone designation of rural residential? My, excuse me, my understanding is yes, that they've all consented to be annexed and that they're comfortable with the proposed zoning. Are the applicants here? <clears throat> yes. They are. We'd like to go all the we'll, way. We'll call you up in a second. Okay. Do you, anybody else have any questions for Dave or staff? Thank you. Thank you. If we have the applicant or a representative of them come up and address us from the podium, you will please state your name so the TV can hear it. 
Kevin Pritchett and uh, part of Elevate Development. And uh, the, the properties there, yeah, we're under control of those properties and, and we're in agreement with that. We'd like to, to go all the way to I-15 to the west, but we can't get Rex Larson to give up his pumpkin patch yet. So <laughs> anyway, yeah, we're all in agreement with that and looking forward to working and getting it to work. I mean, it's the only uh, exit, as you know, uh, from Ogden to Nephi that doesn't have anything on it. So we're looking at, for commercial-wise to be able to do some commercial and some residential stuff down the road. But You control all the property in this annexation? We do. Okay. How many, how many property owners are there in that annexation? There's three. So. Any other questions for Mr. Pritchett? Great. Okay. Thank, Thank you. you. Commissioners, do you have any topics you want to discuss or go over? If not, then I'd entertain a motion one way or the other. I move that the Planning Commission recommends approval of the West Meadows at Spanish Fork annexation and recommends approval of the zoning designation of rural residential subject to the applicant's compliance with staff's findings and conditions. Great. I have a motion. Do I have a second? Second. I have a motion and a second. All in favor? Aye. 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 Any opposed? Okay. So that, that will now go forward to, I guess, to the county and then to the city council. Exactly. Yeah. Yes. Okay. Uh, next topic, uh, we have a couple public hearing items on conditional use permit. The first one being Kidstopia Playground. I think most of you will recall a text amendment that was made earlier this year to add indoor playgrounds as a conditional use in our industrial one zone. Um, the conversations that we had is that proposal was being reviewed by you and the city council. Um, were the result of this proposal, in fact, uh, prior to being able to get to the point to where tonight we can ask you as the Planning Commission to consider approving an indoor playground in the Industrial One Zone, those changes to uh, to the text of our zoning code needed to be made. So that being said, uh, the proposal sorry for being redundant here, but is to have an indoor playground approved at 859 East, 1950 North um, to provide a little bit more orientation for the site that we're talking about. Uh, it's, I would say, a brand new industrial building. It's, it's not immediately north of the hospital, but not too far north of the hospital. Um, they would be occupying uh, approximately a third of this building right here, uh, the, the southern portion of that building. And um, indeed, this was the very location that we talked about when the text amendment was reviewed. So there's not much that's changed uh, from uh, what we understood then that the applicants wanted to do. And if you can help me out. So this is a site plan of what we we're just looking at uh, by way of the aerial image. These three buildings have been built. Um, uh, this is where Kidstopia would be located. Kidstopia is the, the business name of the, the indoor playground that we're talking about. Um, incidentally, um, what is represented on this plan here uh, currently is is owned by the same entity, um, but we'll talk in a second about a condition of approval that's intended to, to provide uh, for the potential that you know, any one of these these five different parts of the site were to be sold to a, a different party in the future, um, which maybe just talk a little bit more about that now. Um, as proposed, again, it's an indoor playground. The use is entirely inside of a building. Um, as we found when we reviewed the text amendment, I think for a lot of reasons, um, these types of uses typically are looking for spaces with really high ceilings. 
um, big open spans, you know, without columns and different things like that, interrupting them. Uh, contemporary industrial space works pretty well, and therefore it's not uncommon to see these types of uses in this type of a setting. Now that being said, there are some inherent things that uh, we think potentially are concerns about putting a uh, business that is intended to cater to you know, little people, families, and different things like that. And it really has to do with traffic more than anything else. And it, frankly, I think it's probably just serendipitous more than anything that the site here has been designed so that um, the uh, vehicular parking you know, for passenger cars, parking that would be made available for employees, um, patrons, uh, and such, um, is fairly well separated from the routes that um, bigger vehicles would take around the site. Um, but that indeed has been kind of the focus of, of our review. What can be done to make sure that the site is as safe for pedestrians as it can be? We've offered some suggestions. They're found um, with the conditions of approval that we're recommending that you consider, um, and the applicants have consented to, to do those things. Uh, it has to do, just to point them out kind of high level, uh, adding some signage to denote you know, pedestrian crossings, um, constructing uh, some additional walkway space to get people from a parking lot to a sidewalk um, as easily as possible hopefully therefore encouraging people to take um, that route as opposed to maybe just walking down a drive aisle, um, adding some additional striping to identify space for pedestrians. Relatively simple stuff, um, but in all candor, uh, again, the site is laid out fairly well already, I think, to, to keep you know, kind of the two types of traffic that we're concerned about uh, naturally separated. Now, the other concern is just the amount of parking that a use like this would require. I think across the board, um, the demand per square foot for parking for this type of use is going to be higher than what we would see for most other uses that would go into this type of space. Your typical you know, warehouse, maybe even manufacturing types of uses. But that being said, um, uh, both currently with the parking that exists with the portion of the site that's been developed with the three buildings and what will be available when when the whole project is constructed. Um, I think the numbers are in favor of either the owners of the site or uh, the folks that will operate Kidstopia. There should be ample parking. Uh, we did talk about one scenario uh, where the complementary nature of most of the uses that would locate in space like this, their peak parking demand when they'll need parking the most, it's generally going to be 8 to 5 Monday through Friday. Throughout much of the year, the peak parking demand for Kidstopia will be outside of those hours, be weekends, evenings, and that type of a thing, which um, I think is great to have that complementary kind of relationship. We've talked about that in some other contexts. You know, maybe Christmas vacation. When you've got kids at home, it's winter. Uh, they're not going outside. Parents want to take them someplace. Um, you know, but for you know maybe that week or ten days or so, really think that uh, um, there should be ample parking and no concerns. But uh, again, that is the other issue: just the amount of parking by way of number of spaces that are available, as well as a route for pedestrians. That's what we focused on, and with the conditions that are proposed, we're, we're comfortable recommending that uh, the proposal be approved. Um, indeed, the Development Review Committee made that recommendation last week, so. Can we go back to this other slide that had the parking on it? What is the parking count for that the building that Kidstopia is located in? It doesn't say it in the red there, I just can't read it. Yeah. I might have to ask for a minute to find an image that I can read. Is that well? Can I blow that up. I don't know if you can zoom in. I don't know if it's going to be too granular, but yeah, Ian, can you? Steph's findings use the word adequate as well instead of a specific. So I like your question. Hmm. The 
Dr. Raven goes into Thank you. saying that. Thank you. Help validate me that you like my question. Yep. Right right. It's something we could hone in on if we wanted mm -hmm. to. So the building that Kidstopia would be located in, um, it's what we see up at the top there. It's the called Raven the Raven Building. building. Okay. Um, so so there's 70 that. altogether along that whole stretch. And kids currently told you would 58 is what our code would require that okay. they have access to. Great. Now, uh, that building is not entirely occupied. And right. the use that's there now is using 15. So clearly, we are counting on parking being available in the other parts of the site to be able to satisfy... Um, the demand that Kidstopia and other uses in the Raven building is would generate. Is parking a lot at Marketplace Drive? It is. So right now, though, how many of there's four different sections of the building? One of them is being used? One other one's being used. One other one. So Kidstopia and one other. Right. Well, there's currently, we have three units leased. We have one vacant. Okay. The, the, okay. That includes the Kidstopia as being part of Okay. Very good. Next time, Sam. Hey, you're doing a great job. You're doing a great job. We'll call you up in a minute. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. We'll call yeah. you up in a minute. Well, well, but thank you for clarifying that there are, there are three units leased right now. Is the 15 number this parking for the three tenants then? The 15, for the current, current tenants, which I thought was just one tenant mm -hmm. that's in there now. That's good. Yeah. That will change as tenants change, but right. yeah. And then could we scroll over a little bit so I can get a better view of the Kidstopia, the site plan in front of it? So Dave, you had mentioned um, sidewalk access and making it easier for the uh, kids or the parents as they're dropping people off to get from the drop-off area or the parking area uh, via a sidewalk. Where, where are you proposing that at? Or where, where is, is the city talk to the applicant? Or? Can you kind of zoom in? And I apologize, it's going to be a little bit a little bit uh, pixelated. Um, currently, there's a crosswalk striped right here mm -hmm. and two ADA parking spaces on either side of that. There's a similar arrangement up here. Um, there's landscaping that separates this parking and that crosswalk from the sidewalk that's in the right of way of 1950 North. So they would be constructing a ramp or sidewalk to make that connection from that striped crosswalk to the sidewalk in 1950 North. So it really does get to a crossing here. It's highly visible, open, um, a great place to, to sign, you know, pedestrian crossing, and would allow anybody that's parking here to get to a sidewalk here and to cross here before they're on a, a um, I was gonna say grade separated, that's kind of extreme, but, you know, on, to get to a sidewalk here that, that's Instead of going to the parking so lot, they're, they're, they're following a, a walkway, a designated walkway. Exactly, to get yeah, to that. versus walking in the parking lot. Maybe that's the best way okay. to say it. Very good. There'd be a what similar. Is the, sorry. The route for the, the trucks on the west, depending on what those tenants may or may not be, kids hope you won't have trucks going in and out of it, I don't think, unless they're delivering something. Um, so, for instance, the building there that is horizontal, those trucks leave that site through what means? Yeah, so. Um, to the north, along the north edge of this building, the drive aisle is not designed to accommodate trucks pulling trailers. Okay. So this would be in and out. So they have to go out on yeah. 950. Yeah, conceivably, I mean, if you had a box truck or something like that, mm -hmm. I think you can navigate and coming this back building, this way. Which way does this traffic flow? As the truck pulls out of here, does it come out or does it have now, to go this way? This is. Uh, I think for the same reason, this is not designed to accommodate that truck yeah, traffic, whereas you have um, a really, really wide apron over here okay. to allow for that. Again, for trucks with trailers. Okay. Would, would you mind um, going back to the, at the very beginning onto the map? Because I'm looking at Google Maps on my computer, but it's not updated with the yeah. buildings. So I'd like to see what this looks like exactly where it is in proximity to the hospital. 
Oh, it's one of the first slides you showed us, right? Oh, yeah, that one. Can you zoom in on that? Oh, you can. Okay. Can you just go to, go to like, the city. Just go like that. <laughs> well, on your map, Ian's great. If we just give him like ten Ball. seconds, and that he'll be right, right where we want to be. There. Right oh. Okay. Which, by the way, Shauna. Oh, okay. Okay, that makes sense. On our city's website, we have aerial images that are about five weeks old. Oh, okay. So, very good. If you're looking in Spanish work, bag Google Earth. Uh -huh. And go to the city's website, okay. the interactive map. Um, was that that drone the other day? That was it? Taking pictures? I uh, Just kidding. Okay, and so <laughs> where we're looking at is, is it 807, uh, 859? It's right here. Yeah, 859, I believe. 859. Okay, gotcha. <laughs> okay. <laughs> yeah. Thank you. That's helping me. Okay. Can we hear from the applicant, or do you have? Do we have any more questions for Dave? Or? For me, thank you. I'd like to hear from the applicant and just get an idea of what they're expecting as far as customers and things like that. I don't know who that. If you'd like to come up and address us, that'd be great. Bring the whole bunch. So I'm just Sam Gustafson. State in the mic so the, oh. the camera can hear you. Yeah, I'm I'm Sam Gustafson, and this is. I'm Yang Yang. I'm the owner of the Kate's Topia. Thank you. Um, I just had a couple questions because one of the issues that is a concern for me is parking and just making sure the children and parents get access safely in an industrial area into the building. What are you, do you have projections, or I don't know if there's other facilities like this, of how many people will be coming in at a given time, when your peak times are? David mentioned that they're like after work hours. I have grandchildren that are pre, you know, preschool years. Uh -huh. They go to places like this during during work times. So I just want to get an idea from you guys what you expect that traffic to be. There are two other locations. Mm -hmm. There's one up in Syracuse and there's one in Bluffdale. And I'm going to let uh, Yum Yum speak to that on, on the traffic and the parking and whatnot. Okay. So actually, yes, like right now and uh, after the school start from uh, September, October, and all that are really nice. And uh, during the daytime, maybe 10 kids. But during the winter time, of course, we will be busier during the daytime. But you know, the most of the kids are going to school. Even the, like the little one, they are going to the preschool. And uh, our, for the daily, uh, from Monday to Thursday, after four, we will have a party and we will have, we will have the public coming in. Kind of is a big wave from after four. And, uh, but of course, during the, the weekend, from Friday, Saturday, and Sunday, we're all busy. But the rest of them, the companies, uh, they are not using the parking anymore. So, and uh, for, 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 for me, it's, uh, I think only the winter time, the, like the Thanksgiving break, the one week, some of the company are working still, and the, the, uh, also the Christmas break, and the holiday, the two weeks winter break for the school. Mm -hmm. And the, that will be our busiest time, mm -hmm. even during the daytime, Monday to Thursday. Okay. Yeah. Typically though, during school hours, on a typical, it's, it's 10 to yeah. 20 people maybe. Yeah. Okay. At your peak time, sorry, Sean. At your peak time, after school in after the winter, school, how yeah. many how many cars or how many people do you see in your facility? So it's uh, depending. So for our Bluffdale location, we only have a nine thousand square feet. So the capacity only two hundred thirty. Mm -hmm. Even the the busy the time during the day, I mean after four, maybe a hundred, something like that. Okay. Yeah. Okay. But uh, I mean, if I have more. Capacity, maybe a Spanish fork will have more, double size, 17,000. So maybe 400 capacity, but I, I'm not sure, <laughs> maybe 200 or 300. Mm -hmm. okay. But they, they don't all have cars. Yeah, <laughs> they they have mom dropping they, off. They have that. friends. Two or three, three or four right. kids. And, yeah, okay. and it's three or four, five kids in one win. So. But let me address that. 
Um, we, we um, Mike Robinson and our partnership have looked into this quite um, in depth. And as part of the lease agreement that we've signed with um, Kidstopia, is that during these during these busy times, is that they have agreed to to provide some sort of um, uh, um, parking attendant to make sure that the the people are going, you know, to the particular areas and parking where they're supposed to be, and also watching, you know, for traffic coming and going. That 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 was one of the it is one of the stipulations that we have in the agreement. And uh, we, you know, as far as being, um, you know, careful with the young children, that that was our biggest concern. We, we just need somebody out during the busy times to watch and guide and direct people yeah. where they should go. Okay. okay, I have a couple of questions. So, Mr. Gustafson, you own the building, is that right? You're the... I, I'm one of the owners. You're one of the owners of yes, the building, uh -huh. and then you're leasing to Kidstopia. Right. Okay. That I had to get that straight. And then the other thing is, is how does this plan for your Kidstopia here compare to the size of your Bluffdale and your Syracuse locations? Do you want to... Do you understand that? No. So you're what one... Is, so what's the square feet of this one versus what's the square feet of Bluffdale and Syracuse locations of your Kidstopia? It, this one here is 17,000 yep. square feet. 17,000. Kidstopia is what, 10? Bluffdale is 9,000, and the Roy Ogden, that, that one is 12,000. Yes. Okay. Because this is my third one, I have a more idea come out. I need a bigger space. Okay. And which... And is your, are your other locations also in industrial areas yes. such as Bluff, this? Yes, Bluffdale, exactly the same thing. And it runs smoothly? Yes. With the neighbors? Yeah, yeah, yeah. And uh, when the uh, company are uh, uh, after work, it's our busiest time. We can use all the parking. Okay, um, and I have to say, I'm looking up your web. I looked up your website, and I I am bringing my grandchildren here. <laughs> this gets approved. This looks so fun. Yes, a lot of fun. This one is bigger, more fun. Everything. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, seriously. Yeah. The bigger it is, the funner it is. Yes. <laughs> Questions for uh, what's the hours like? What what's the hours are going to open? Good. So for right now, for the Bluffdale, and uh, we are open from ten to six. And why we are not open very late? We um, because that is not really big, and some of the party they want the private. They have the whole thing. So after six, we have a private party until six uh, until eight. Okay. And uh, for the Roy location, and uh, ten to seven and the 10 to 8 for the weekends. Okay. Mm -hmm. Very good. I have a question for Sam. <clears throat> uh, Sam, one of the conditions of approval, the proposed conditions of approval, yes. is a memorandum by Dave Anderson. And one of the items is particularly for you and your your members uh -huh. as owners of the property. And the, the item is that cross parking and cross access easements be put in place for the parcels identified on the attached image before business license can be issued to kids, Kidstopia. Is that something you're aware of and willing to do? Yes, I'm aware of it. We had discussion about it at our DRC meeting, and we've conceded that, yes, we'll go ahead and record a deed so that um, it will go with the property. Easement. An easement, yeah. We'll, we'll record an easement so that um, it travels with the property. Okay. Uh, there won't be any miscommunication on, you know, if, if we have a change of tenancies or if we have a change of ownership, it'll stay that way. Okay. And we've agreed to go ahead and, and uh, do that. Thank you. Great. Okay. Thank you. Okay. Thank you. Dave, I have one other question uh, based on what the applicant told us. Um, in it, there could be, uh, they're projecting two to 400 people in this facility. I, I really like that the um, landowner has agreement in their lease that they'll provide a parking lot attendant. I, that, I think that helps out a lot. It's like having a, well, an usher or a crossing guard helping out with that. Um, would that be suitable to have that be part of, from the city standpoint, because that's between the landowner and his lease. 
from our standpoint, would it be suitable to have that as one of the points in the memorandum? Um, let me just think that through for a quick second. Uh, Thinking through out loud with you yeah. and Todd, um, if, if it's not a city requirement, the le leases can be amended at any right. time. So just be aware of that. Hence yeah, my that's concern. true. It, it, so I'll just... Because I like that. I, that that reassures me. Uh, I'm like just worried about the children's and parents' safety you as know. kids are distracted or having a great time at this facility. Um, they come out the door to get back in the truck with dad or whatever. I, I just uh, that helps me be rest assured. That there's there's somebody with an eye on safety watching what's going on. I, I like that idea. It's something they've already worked out between themselves. I wonder if that would be something that would be appropriate to be in this memorandum also. So I'll take a stab at it and just share my thought. I invite uh, Joshua, anybody else to weigh in as well. Um, it's certainly something we would want to encourage, so I don't want what I'm going to say to be taken as any suggestion that, that we wouldn't welcome that and want to see it. Um, and for, it's kind of a, maybe a timing thing, but I'm particularly uh, um, concerned at the moment with us doing things that are clearly enforceable by the city. That would probably be the only thing that would make me somewhat reluctant to, to wholeheartedly say mm -hmm. yes. Uh, it makes perfect sense to add that as another condition of approval. As Mr. Ernest said, um, unless it's a condition of approval, though, we wouldn't have any basis for enforcing it. Um, leases can change, you know, as tenants come and go, um, which incidentally, um, the conditional use will run with the property, not with the business. Um, somebody would have to come in and operate, you know, essentially an identical business to Kidstopia. Um, but uh, I don't know if that helps or not. Uh, good idea, probably a little bit tricky to enforce. Okay. City, so, yeah, I have anything? Tricky to stipulate, too. Right. Yeah. Who decides when it's busy enough? and. Right. What times and it's more money. And well, I think they did. They specified, if I understood right, they specified it to a time. Uh, there are busier times. That have peak, that. which yeah. I like. Um, any other points to go over? Great. We'll entertain a motion if anybody has anything to. Public hearing? No. Oh, public hearing. Sorry. Yes, it is. I apologize. Um, this is a public hearing. If anybody has any. Uh, thoughts or topics to discuss on this matter, we'd welcome you to come up and uh, say something. We limit comments from the public to three minutes. Um, but if anybody would like to come up and address us, please come to the podium and state your name. Okay, seeing none, we'll adjourn the public hearing. And now I'll go to my comments. If we have anybody would like to make a motion, I would entertain that. I move to approve the conditional use permit for Kidstopia, subject to um, the included staff findings and conditions. Second. I have a motion and a second. All in favor? Aye. 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 Any opposed? Okay. Motion passes. The next topic, uh, also public hearing, is the Denali concrete uh, proposal. Once again, thank you, Mr. Chairman. There are two parts to this proposal. One is a zone change to change the zoning of the subject property from industrial one to industrial two. I think that's actually next on your agenda, but um, I'll kind of talk them through together. Um, zone changes are legislative acts, so that's something that the city council ultimately would act on and make a decision on. So on that, um, we will look for the commission tonight, if you're inclined to act tonight, to make a recommendation on that, that proposed zone change to industrial two. And the other part, um, like Kidstopia, is a conditional use approval request. And with that, you are the land use authority as the planning commission. So um, if indeed you're, you're inclined to see this proposal be approved, um, we would look to you tonight to uh, approve the conditional use with or without whatever conditions you'd like to see included and to make a um, recommendation on 
on the zoning, which in fact, uh, any uh, decision that you make on the conditional use, at least to approve it, that would uh, be subject to the council acting to approve the zone change. Does that make sense? Okay. Um, the subject property in this case is located on 3rd West on the north side of railroad tracks at the crossing of uh, where, where they, they cross 3rd West at approximately 1600 North. Uh, the subject property is outlined in yellow on the image that we're showing there. It's a triangular shaped site, just over three acres in size. And it's part of a parcel that is also occupied by a plant that was recently constructed. It's plant number three for Mountain Country Foods. Um, I feel like a little bit of background might be helpful relative to the proposal. Um, we've been working with the applicant here for about two years to try to find a suitable location for some type of a, um, a concrete batching, concrete product producing, concrete mixing business, and I'll maybe let them explain a little bit more about what they do. Uh, they've been operating um, from a site on 2nd West, not far from the city shops, um, on property that's zoned industrial one. And as we've looked into what the applicants um, do there, um, and they want to essentially, as I understand it, uh, both continue what they're doing and to, to expand their operation, we found that the industrial two zone is necessary for the use that they're uh, both doing and that they want to do into the future and that um, with that as well a conditional use approval is required so they've looked um, for suitable property um, it just happens to be that they have an ownership interest in this site here as well so i think that's the biggest reason for us uh, ending up talking about this particular site for the proposed use um, although, honestly, uh, um, I think it's hard to find many properties in our light industrial zone these days that would um, be as easy to support a zone change to I-2 as this one. Um, and uh, to a large measure, that's the site's adjacency to the railroad tracks, a really large manufacturing building to the north um, as maybe being the two two biggest reasons for feeling like it's it's an appropriate location. Um, the nuts and bolts of the use, and this is a site plan um, at the scale we're looking at there. It's probably not terribly helpful, but um, I'm not sure which one to refer to. This is the existing building, right? Or this is, is, yes. This is the existing building. Um, Todd. And you know what, Ian? Let's just go to the aerial images. I think those you know, help describe things better. We'll come back to some of the specifics. So um, maybe go to the, I think it's the next one. It's the one after the next one. So yeah, brand new manufacturing facility here. Um, they make edible things here. They're for pets, but as I understand it, they are subject to some pretty stringent quality control uh, types of regulations. And in fact, that uh, um, the regulations are every bit as stringent as they would be if they were manufacturing things for human consumption, which to a degree, I think, has uh, maybe pacified some of the concerns that we would have as staff by way of uh, the site generating a lot of dust or otherwise just simply being a bad neighbor. Um, they can only be a bad neighbor to a certain extent before they adversely impact um, something that they also have an ownership interest in. So um, perhaps some self-policing there is anticipated. Um, one of the things that's a little bit unique about the proposal, um, and this is something that um, we, uh, we always look at from a little bit of a, a jaded perspective, um, the idea that uh, what's proposed now may have some type of a temporary nature to it. We, um, temporary things often become very permanent <laughs> uh, regularly. But uh, uh, for example, 
with what's proposed now, they're not proposing to construct any permanent buildings. So they wouldn't be providing, for example, restrooms or office space or that type of a thing with the, uh, the concrete uh, manufacturing type of use here, but indeed would utilize facilities that are in this plant here uh, for their office space and restrooms and you know some of the basic needs that employees here would have. Um, it's a really, really unique arrangement in that regard, and we've made a condition or two, or we've recommended that a condition or two be considered relative to how that that currently exists and how it, I think certainly could continue to, to exist well into the future. Um, but uh, that being said, uh, the thing that people would notice the most would be a portable concrete batch plant that would be give or take right here on the site. Um, a, a drive approach would be constructed um, off of Third West approximately here. An asphalt drive would be built to get to and from the portable batch plant. The remainder of the site or a good part of the remainder of the site would be be left in you know some type of a gravel or road-based material for the time being and um, that's that uh, in addition to a uh, masonry wall being constructed at their property line and the right-of-way line along third west um, those are the Probably main or will it extend down in front of the other building also pardon me will it just be in front of this triangle piece or will it extend down it the would wall? just be in front of the triangular piece um, those are the main improvements that would be seen uh, with the proposal um, and with that, uh, and now, Ian, if you can go back maybe to the batch plant image or two, um, this is what people would notice. So 50 to 55 feet tall uh, here. Um, I am not an expert in facilities like this. I do know that they're portable. Um, the applicants mentioned that there's something, if not identical, really similar to this right now on called the old Santana property. Um, southeast corner of uh, I-15 and 2700 North where the interchange is being constructed. It's really common, I know, to see things like this that are taken from one sizable, you know, uh, for example, like road construction project or, or that type of a thing to another. Um, but uh, yet, we're certainly not talking about something like Staker Parsons, you know, the facility that's on on 2nd East over there, so. Um, that all being said, uh, um, part of the, uh, the spirit of what's being proposed tonight really is an effort to rectify what we view as a problem with the current operation on 2nd East uh, that the applicants operate. I think this is, is a great way to you know, find a kind of a middle ground and a way to satisfy their desire to continue to operate and to make something fit within Spanish Fork City's zoning regulations. Um, I'm not sure that long term this would be the ideal for the applicants, you know, should they um, have a business that grows and expands. And indeed, that also is uh, um, the reasoning behind some of the other conditions that we have proposed uh, with the conditional use. But um, in a nutshell, this is something that the Development Review Committee has discussed um, at least a handful of times over the course of the past couple of years. And um, the DRC made a recommendation to approve both the zone change and the conditional use subject to the proposed conditions uh, just last week. So that's where we're at. Question. For the aerial, I have a question for I feel like I. I'm going to be surprised if the answer is something other than what I'm expecting, but I just want to be sure, just in case. Right there, from the aerial, there's a bunch of structures, a lot of, a lot of little small structures. None of those are residential dwellings, correct? The farm right there? Yes, right there. That's the one I'm talking about. There are homes on the west side of third west today i i don't know off the top of my head if anyone resides here farm yard i think that's a hallam property is that right mm -hmm. um 
I, I think it might be just off of what we're looking at here to the south, though, to where there is another dwelling or two on the, the west side of Third West. Uh, yeah. Still there. Yeah. He, where? The home is just further south of the of the railroad. Right there. Right there. But you, you, there's none immediately to the west no. of the subject site. That is that is uh, a farmyard. That, uh, so that's the home, right? You're talking about? Okay. I just wanted to confirm. Yeah. We can do a, a deeper dive. To, and I don't believe there are homes north of this one, Commissioner Mendenhall, on the west side there. There's not. Okay. I mean, we're getting easements for a water line right there. Okay. It's, it's not home. Thank you. My question. And it's county property right there, interestingly enough. It is still county property. Right across the street. Yep. Mm -hmm. My question is noise. Is there any, can, are, is there a noise impact? Uh, anyway, what kind of noise does something like this make? What impact does it have around? I hope so. Do you have experience that? Since I do located? not. That's a great question. We should have asked that sooner. Is, and that was my concern: was it, it, this is a farmyard, but there's a home there. I mean, yeah. What kind of noise are they used to with already an industrial uses next to them? And a train track that's active. yeah. Well, if, you, if you'll true. zoom down a little bit again, please. But that yeah. that residence would have been noticed. This is all industrial right next to it now. Oh, okay. That just got built. They might be right on the boundary right. of a 300 foot. I can I can check that though. Okay. And it is all industrial. Is the applicant here? That they could speak they some of these things. Yeah. You you want to podium? Maybe address some of these comments from Commissioner, yeah. please. Dave, I found the city map. I'm looking at it. It's awesome. It looks great. Yeah. Yep. <laughs> So if you'd state your name and yeah, you bet. Thanks for having us. Uh, I'm Troy Tishner and I'm Bryce Taylor. So we're both uh, partners in Denali. We have one more. Uh, he's not able to make it tonight, but uh, to address the noise question, very minimal. It, it's trucks coming in and out, um, just just like the plant has now. Semis coming in and out. It, it, there's really no noise per se um, in relation to just basic truck you know, truck noise coming in and out. Um, there's really no, yeah, there's, there's, there's virtually nothing. We, we'll have a, a track or a wheel loader there to load the, the trucks, you know, to facilitate the batch plant. Um, but as far as like any, any noise above what would, what I would call a regular traffic noise there, there's none. Okay. Construction guys have a different idea of noise than you do, though. Yeah, that's definitely it, no this, That's true. Is this batch plant a wet plant, or is it dry? It's dry. It's dry. Dry all the way. Yep. And how many trucks, uh, what's the truck traffic Truck traffic and anticipated to be, how many, how many loads a day in and out? So we, we anticipate running about five drum trucks out of there, and then two, we have a, uh, the, the operation we're running now, they're volumetric trucks, uh, if you guys are familiar with those, but they're a dry batch truck. They go out and they, you, you load the material on site, then you actually mix it on the job site. Um, where this transition is where the traditional drum trucks that you see running around everywhere. Yes. Um, it's a little bit different operation, but as far as like traffic load and everything, um, we, we anticipate about seven trucks total running out of there with loads. Um, material coming in, um, a, couple, a couple double side dumps a day. Um, nothing, I mean, a mere fraction of what Mount Country does currently. I mean, they have, you know, anywhere from 10 to 15 semis in there at any given time. Where I, I would say a couple a day would be pretty pretty fair expectation there for what we'll be doing what's the capacity of your trucks uh 10 10 yards 10 yards yep okay yep you mentioned no crunching grinding none oh, of that. No. Oh. and that was limited not only by what we're doing but also in the city regulation as well there we no no crushing involved there okay do you have uh means to suppress the dust there will be there'll be some dust yep yeah 
Yep, so uh, the dust, like there's def different types of it, obviously, um, that dust magic stuff, calcium chloride, I think is what it is. That's, that's one of the means that we're gonna be putting on there. We'll have, um, you know, just overall dust suppression for any of the loads coming in and out. But I, th I think the, the biggest key to this, just to hold us accountable is the, the Mount Country Foods, there, there's, we, there can't be any dust. Um, Mike is partner with us on this, and so he's got interest, um, very strict interest that there's to be no dust. And so um, we don't want to create dust. He can't have dust. No one wants dust. There, that'll be that'll be number one priority for sure. So, thank you. It is on, on the plant we have. It's a pretty state of the art dust vacuum system that actually, as the trucks are being batched, that that vacuum literally sucks the dust. Right, you know, any any that is made, it, it sucks right up in, and then we can reuse that powder. So it's it's pretty pretty advanced system as far as that the batching goes. So great. I've got two other questions. Um, how many people do you have working on the site at a time? So right now we we only employ three, um, myself and, and two others. Um, that with growth, obviously each truck will need need a guy. Um, I, I we're, we're unsure on when that will be um, going into winter and, and getting this started up obviously is some questions, but yeah, but each truck will need a driver. I mean, there's gonna be five to eight of us in this facility. I, I don't, the, 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 the land will only allow us to, we, we can only have so much there, right? It's, it's not a huge piece. Um, this, and, and Dave did a good job of making that contrast between Staker and us. Um, this is not a Staker Parsons operation at all. I mean, they have 35, 40 trucks over there. Um, we're a f mere fraction of what they're going to be doing, you know, of, in, in comparison. So, um, five, five to eight employees probably is is a fair a fair guess at this site. So, and then you have an agreement with Mountain Country Foods for to use offices and facilities over there. Yes, you already do. It's not pending. Well, I I think it's still. I don't no, know if it got drafted up or not. I yeah. wasn't here for the last DRC. We do for sure. Okay. Oh, yes. Okay. Great. Okay. My question is, um, you guys were trying to answer it from the back, and we were kind of speculating and, and that there's no residences. Do you know for sure there are no residences across the street? That's that's a good question. I, I know it kind of like what you guys have picked up. It's just a farm <coughs> farm piece, um, cattle, pigs, and stuff in there. I, I'd, I'd be curious myself to look in there and see if it's actually a resident. I don't believe it is. I, I do think it's just a little hobby farm in there. If, if you're speaking directly west across the street. He doesn't consider it a hobby. Would it tell you if there's a residential dwelling unit? I have There's any ownership, but not very literally. What are we looking up, Brandon? There's somebody living across the street. That's right. I mean, right, that was the issue. There are buildings there, but they're not residences. Does anybody have any other questions Why Joseph and Brandon are looking at for the applicant? Mm -hmm. Thank you. Yeah, thank Appreciate you. Appreciate it. Thanks, guys. Did you, do you want to disclose what you guys found? Uh, we were looking at baseball scores. Oh. <laughs> so I'll repeat. Do you want to disclose what you found? What did you click on? Abstract? The appraisal. Oh, appraisal. We're trying to figure out what all the structures on this on these properties. Both, so far, two of them say residential vacant, so that's a good sign, so far. But I don't know if it's conclusive. Brandon seems like it's con conclusive. Having driven that road for years when I worked at Longview, it's residential vacant on this one too. It looks like just a like a barn. Yep. Garage. There's an old there's an old milk house there, and they're all outbuildings mostly for equipment. And uh, he has a pig operation. He raises maybe up to 20 pigs there. 
few cows, a couple of horses. It's they, mostly his equipment. Each, each of the three properties lists is supposedly listing the structures in the appraisal information on the county records. Yeah. And there are no residential structures listed. No. So. Right. And I think Street View as well. I mean, it, you can get a sense that there are no dwellings there. No. Okay. Um, we'll now open up the public hearing. Uh, if anybody has any comments on this topic, we would welcome you to come up and speak. Seeing none, we'll close public hearing. Any other comments from any other commissioners? Any follow-up questions for the applicant or for staff? Okay, I'll entertain a motion then. Yeah, I'm just looking up the, I'm opening the, the document back up. Mike's got yeah. it. Oh, go Mike. I'll, I'll make the motion that we recommend approval of the, we approve. this is the conditional use. We approve. Yeah. We approve yeah, the approve. conditional use uh, pending the staff's findings and conditions. Okay, I have a motion and second on the conditional use. Second. Okay, I have a motion and second. All in favor? Aye. 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 Dave, do we need to make a recommendation for the other side of that also? Yep. Now we, yeah, now we have a zone change. Yeah, for the zone change, uh, do I have a motion on that? It'd be appropriate just to double check there's no public comment on the zone change. Okay. Do we have any public comment on the zone change as proposed? Seeing none, we'll close that hearing also. Thank you, Brandon. Commissioners? I move that uh, we recommend well that, that the proposed zone act zone, zone change rec, uh, recommendation be uh, that we recommend to the city council that it will be uh, that we let me start over that the proposed zone change be recommended to the city council for approval based on the follow on the uh, items and findings of the. Second. Okay, motion a second. All in favor? Aye. 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 Any opposed? Thank you. So that's been recommended to go before the city council in two weeks. Okay. Next item of business is also this section is also uh, open to public hearing. The first item, so I guess, would be the Hardy zone change. We already did the, we already, we took care of the uh, Denali one with what we just did, right? Yeah. Um, so the Hardy zone change. So the proposal uh, <clears throat> for the zone change, it's for property located at uh, 167 North, 100 West. Um, it's currently uh, in the R3 zone uh, with the land use of high density. Um, the applicant is proposing uh, a zone change to apply the infill overlay zone in order to build a fourplex on the property. Um, with their proposal, there's uh, currently two houses on the property. The, prop the house on the south side uh, will be demoed with, um, with a garage that would be put in, in roughly the same place to be used by the other house that's existing. And then the fourplex would be built um, behind, behind that house. Um, they, the applicant submitted a site plan, elevations, and a landscape plan to be reviewed by staff as part of their application. Uh, went to DRC last Thursday um, where it was discussed. Um, there was the topic of uh, ownership as far as the the rental the fourplex on whether or not they'd be owner occupied or be rental units um, staff did emphasize that um, owner occupied is is kind of what we'd like to see but it's not uh, something that's required as part of uh, approving this type of overlay zone um, and then two aspects of uh, that the need to be that are part of the approval process for the infill overlay zone 
is for the, the neighborhood character to be preserved and for uh, any uh, potential screening um, that would be necessary with the proposal. So if you look at the, the street view, Ian, Well, if you go to the aerial. So the property is surrounded on all four sides um, by other residential uh, properties. Um, the red brick house on the right would be the one that would remain. The white house on the left would be the one that would be <clears throat> removed from the property. Um, so with this, uh, staff feels that the, the character of a single family neighborhood um, is preserved with the, with the street presence of a, a well-designed detached garage to the, on the side of the, the existing house. Um, so because of that, staff is recommending um, approval of this as it goes to the City Council. I'd be happy to answer any questions that you might have. Could we see the, uh, the elevation? The, yeah, that one. Behind is the roof line of the fourplex that will be behind it. And then what is the distance? So that, that garage, the 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 garage it looks nice looks great I like it what is the distance uh, between the existing house and where that garage we built for somebody to turn into that garage what is it so five feet 26 feet what is that according to the site plan um, if you want to go to that um, they do show the the footprint of the existing home mm -hmm. that's a little bit um, to the to the west of where the garage is being proposed. I think there's a dimension for that driveway. I just couldn't read it. 26 feet is our minimum. Right. Is that what that, that's what I'm, I couldn't, it's shown on there. I just, if they could blow it up, I can't read it on these pages. <laughs> I know the, where the parking spots are behind the house, uh, that's 26 feet wide. Mm -hmm. So that might help be a reference. It's a little busy with the hatched marks where the old house is. What's the dimension up by the drive approach? Mm -hmm. 20 feet from the road end. Yeah, well. Great. Then we got a couple, there's a couple feet there as it curves into the garage. So yeah. they should be able to make that turn with no problem. <clears throat> I mean, we, we heard uh, from this applicant before they came, before saying, seeking some recommendations. One of them was to, to kind of screen the parking, I, I remember. Was there other comments that we had when they were here before? Have they been addressed? I, I don't remember. I remember just the parking one. I only remember the parking one, too. It, it seems to me like we had a little discussion about with this much driveway and this much impervious uh, material the drainage from this project. You know, is it all sloped back to the street? Is it, is it uh, contained within the lot? I'm assuming Somehow. that's retention right now. That's what it looks like. That's got to be retention for the area. That's what I'm assuming need. Northern would have based that off of the what is needed for that much parking. Very good. Is that, I guess the applicant can speak to that. Yeah. yeah. Good. So with this, I guess I have a question for you. Um, you mentioned that the city has a desire for this to be owner-occupied housing, the, the new fourplex, but it's not a requirement. So this is it's not something the applicant is required to do. It's just a preference that the city has right now. Correct. That's That was the intent behind the, the establishment of this zone when it was put into our code. But it's not a condition. But it's not a condition at this time. Thank you. Any other questions for David? Can we hear from the applicant? Are they, you're here? 
again, please state your name and company or business. And Yeah. My name is uh, Trevor Barlow. I'm with Stan Barlow Construction, and this is Bryce uh, Hardy. He is the owner of the property. Um, so uh, to kind of address a couple of your questions, um, as far as, uh, I mean, I can remember, I mean, I can go back through my notes, but the biggest concern that we had was, was again, making sure that we weren't looking at parking lot. And so we went through and designed that garage. I don't know if we have a slide for it, but we designed the garage to look um, architecturally very similar to the Red House mm -hmm. um, with similar finishes. And we even changed some of the finishes on the fourplex to bring some of that red brick. I mean, obviously, we're not going to be able to match the red brick because it's so old, but we're going to have something close, um, architectural designs in. And then we, I mean, if we go to the landscape design, we, we brought in a lot of uh, trees and shrubbery to kind of help make it not look so much like a parking lot back there. I mean, if from, from the street view, you're going to be able to see very, very little of, of parking at all. Um, uh, the the garage was designed to look like a home and not a garage, so it'll have that eaves and that like man that. door and those, those windows. Um, um, however, the the actual drive approach into the garage will come from uh, towards the red house, so you'll kind of drive in and around um, to get in. Can we just apologize for a second? Can we zoom in on this? I'll Uh, no, on that page, so we can see the landscaping in it too. Yeah, it's hard. And the reason I want to do that is that, to me, that uh, I want to just point out that you're really you addressed what was one of my bigger concerns at the time we met last. Mm -hmm. That looks like it's a continuation of the neighborhood. I I, yeah. I like what you've done there a lot. I, uh, I do too. Yeah, I think that helps it blend in with the rest of the neighborhood. The placement of the landscaping and the, the face of the garage looking like a house. Uh, helps that site quite a bit and the and the elevations on the and the facing on the building behind will marry with that well is that what yeah. you just said yeah the, the architectural designs um, that we have in the garage will be married in each of the units um, uh, mimicking as closely as we can the red house because the red house has that that arched it's entryway is a really awesome house. Mm -hmm. um, so we're going to try and, and bring as many of those architectural en elements into both the garage and the townhomes. Okay. Wonderful. Um, the I'm assuming if we can zoom out on that again, the it looks like a retention pond behind the existing house. Yep. That's based on calcs for this area and the pavement that you have. Yeah. Yeah. So we brought a, a civil engineer into. Uh, um, address all the city concerns with with retention um, and and drainage from the site um, as well as the utilities that the city required great and then uh, David spoke a bit about the I guess he's talking about these being owner occupied what is your intent so that's something that we've been talking about a lot anyway um, before that concern was brought up is is um, uh, condoizing these these units so that uh, we could potentially have them sold in the future and owner occupied. Um, that is something that uh, Bryce here has has thought a lot about and and is very interested in doing. Um, however, we thought that it would kind of throw a wrench in the works if we tried to do it mid mid approval. So uh, it's not something that we intended to do until after the home or everything was built in CFO, and then we can bring it back through. Um, unless there's a uh, desire or, or condition from the city that we needed to do it sooner than we definitely could. I've not heard that. I just wanted to, since it was a point of address, I just want to make sure those, yeah, he, what's he, what your intent was. He's going to live, he, his intention is, I mean, he lives in the Red House now. Mm -hmm. um, his intention is either to remain in the Red House or take one of the townhomes for himself. Um, uh, he uh, does not plan on, on moving out. I mean, obviously one day he will, I'm sure, move, but the intention is nowhere in the near future is he planning on moving to a different pro property or a different location. He's very grounded here. He's lived here for several years and loves it. So, Good. Can you remind us how many parking spaces and then how many park, is it two car garage? Two yeah. car garage and how many parking spaces 
in the back there? I, I'd have to pull that up right off the top of my head. I don't remember. Let's see. Looks like 10. 10? Yeah, so the parking. 10, 10 including the garage? Uh, the four plexes have a single car garage per unit. They have a right. And then there's, so it makes, um, with the with the garages, then the new garages are 16 total. 16. Five units. That's with the plus two, sixteen. Any further comments? Thank you. This is a public hearing. If anybody's here to speak on this uh, applicant, would love to hear your comments. Seeing none, we'll close public hearing. Commissioners, do you have any other? Comments or points for staff or the applicant? Nope. Just really pleased how this will really contribute to the neighborhood. Thank you. I appreciate the work that you've done to make it look like part of the neighborhood and, uh, you know, complied with about all of our requests. So I, I thank you for that. Okay. Uh, I'll entertain a motion if anybody would like to make one. that we recommend the zone change to the city council from uh, the uh, recommended for approval based on the findings and conditions. I have a motion. Do I have a second? Second. I have a motion and a second. All in favor? Aye. 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 Any opposed? Okay. Mr. Chair, do you mind if we do a, a small introduction in between the these two items? If we need to, sure. <laughs> Dave, uh, we have somebody new that I don't recognize as part of your staff that we'd love to meet. Yeah, well, you just got a little bit more familiar with him, Mr. Mann, David Mann. He's been with us now uh, not quite two months, getting close, I think. Uh, comes to us with a lot of great experience. I think, um, well, I know uh, the majority of his career to date was spent in South Jordan, but he's worked with other communities as well. Um, it's been great to have somebody in addition to to Brandon in our shop that has a lot of experience um, in working with other communities, the insight that we have, we can glean from that and how they approach different things and uh, and so forth has been wonderful. So we couldn't be happier than we are to have David with us. And uh, yeah, I am terrible with introductions, so I appreciate you pointing out that, that we hadn't done that in this forum yet. So Welcome to Spanish Fork, <laughs> best place. You could totally put him on the spot too. I mean, I I kept it high level with intros, but I don't know, anything to add, Dave? No, I'm just happy to be here. I've had I've had a wonderful time getting to know the city and the community, so um, I'm definitely looking forward to continuing to do so. Thank you. Glad to have you. Okay. Um, next topic on the agenda is the Zion's Landing zone change. This is also a public hearing. Ian has taken the lead on this one. He's bringing the confidence. Hi, guys. <laughs> Excited to stand here. All right. So this uh, proposal is for a property that's located up on um, 1500 East and 400 North. Um, it's a proposal to create eight residential single family lots and just a standard subdivision, so not using our master plan development or anything like that. Um, the current zoning for the property is agricultural with the general plan designation of medium density. Um, so this would conform to the general plan um, with what's proposed. Um, a zone change would be required for this proposal. Um, the applicant is requesting a zone change to R16, so 6,000 square foot minimum lots. Um, lots one through seven are right around that 6,000 square foot mark. Um, Lot 8 is closer to like 9,600 square feet. Um, the existing house and other structures on the property will be removed. Um, as you can see, how do you work this thing? Oh, go back on. Yeah, just these structures up there will be removed um, once this gets developed. Um, 
the, if you look at the aerial imagery then, if you scroll forward, um, you can see residential kind of surrounds this property to the south and to the west. Um, then there's the school that abuts uh, the property just to the north. Um, it's kind of in a residential zone already. Um, the internal street also, if we, sorry, jumping around, go back a couple slides. Yeah, it's going to be stubbed here just um, to the east in the event that the neighbors ever want to develop, uh, creating a nice connection there between um, some of these p p possible proposals in the future. Um, the only issues with it um, are there's an access issue where UDOT just needs to give their final approval on the connection to 400 North. Um, some minor utility work, and then easements. Um, so DRC recommends approval um, of this preliminary plat and zone change uh, subject to the findings and conditions in the staff report. Okay. Any questions for staff? I have a question for staff. Did DRC address the idea, the potential future that this could be the only acreage in the entire area that's zoned R16. Um, I'll, I'll provide more context. <laughs> so the general plan has designation is medium density residential, which R16 does fit in, but the other portions of the medium density general plan designation of the entire area is zoned R19 very unlikely to be zoned R16 in the future. There's, it's all built out. But then immediately to the east, the general plan designation is low density residential, which the maximum density on low density residential is R112. And then to the south, all of the zoning is R112 to the south of this particular acreage. And I'm just curious if they commented on that or they just, or they may not have seen it or, or what what their comments were on that, or or your comments, for that matter. Um, I don't believe that they touched on that in DRC staff today. We did at the concept level, and so this project was reviewed as a concept. Um, at one point, there was even a, a potential conversation as far as would it be appropriate for higher densities along the corridor. Uh, that was something that was not supported, and so uh, we did refer the applicant to the range that's provided with the medium density residential. And is it accurate that staff is in favor of this zone change? Yes. I'm wondering, can we go back to the, the map, plat, uh, what's the? The, the site plan? Yes, yeah. this. Are, does this mean that residents, oh wait, Yes, wait, yeah, sure. <laughs> <laughs> Would the residences be facing the circle and have their backyard fenced to the road right there? Is that the orientation? Yeah. Yes, that is the orientation. That is a strange, it's a strange little orientation given what the next door neighbor is. Like it's this big estate lot uh, right next door and it's oriented completely differently to me, it's a strange density, a strange configuration, given what is next door and around it. If I were taking it out of context, out of where it is, it looks like a nice little uh, development, but putting it right where it is on the map, on the property, seems strange to me. Ian, if I can comment and maybe Byron would better answer it. This is a UDOT facility and so we did not have much say <laughs> nor was there any interest in adding additional driveways onto 400 North and so that I don't want to say it forced the developer's hand but it definitely led to one of the reasons why it's designed the way it is off of a single street access. Yeah and I guess if I zoned out if I zoomed out a little bit all of those other homes, the homes across the street have their backyard mm -hmm. to the road, just not right next door. Those are all R112 though. Right? Yeah. Those are much bigger lots once we get close. Yes. Right. Yeah. 
you don't want a lot of private driveways onto that highway. Yeah, I wouldn't. E yeah, I wouldn't. It just seems. Brandon's right to you. Don't want to allow it. Right. They'll right, only yeah. allow one connection. So. I wouldn't promote that either. I just, it just is, kind of a strange configuration to me. So the zoning directly east of this property is and will be what? It's currently agricultural. We're not sure what it could potentially be in the future, but. You want to show them the general plan? That might help you. Yeah. I mean, is, is this going to, so basically this is going to be a little island is what I'm getting at. That's what I, based, if, if the general plan is followed, it will absolutely, it will be a little island of zoning. Or it sets a precedent for the further development Correct. to the east to follow along a similar vein. And is that what we want? Like, have we, it, it's, I feel like we've been pretty firm on preserving this general area for single family homes on larger lots and having other areas of our city have a little bit I, I'm not against higher density it just feels like this is something that we've said over and over again a few times for this area of the city I think you have a lot in this case that it's hard to do, to get the access to do much more than that which does not mean we have to say yes to that they could have it, fewer lots yeah they could have fewer lots point. yeah but to make matters more complicated, which I'm, I'm happy to help make it more complicated. <laughs> He's good at that. Housing prices are insane. Mm -hmm. yeah. And so True. smaller lots are probably good for the situation. But also these, a lot of these to the east, the R112 zoning to the east mm -hmm. has lot sizes that are 6,000 square feet. Yes, but it's zoned R112 and they were able to do it in an MPD but it is significantly further away, and, and immediately east is low de density residential. And right now we don't know what the request will be when that agricultural land no. is developed. Yeah. We just know what the general plan says. That's right. And you really, and can't, the, you really can't base anything off that kind of, yeah. And remind me what size the lots are do. around the school in that yellow area. Those are one nine. They're actually those nine. Are, those are nine. Yeah, I've been checking. But check it. Let's check. Just confirm. So this one's 13,000. Uh, 464. I believe that's zoned R19. Is that right? Yeah, it could be R19 MPD, which means they could be smaller, but average lot size has to be 9,000 square feet. This one's 8,400. Yeah. It's compliant if, as long as it's MPD, which I'm sure it is. Or it might predate what we currently have. On Not the that books. you're asking me, but. My initial reaction is an R19 with an MPD because there is no R16 in the area. I'd be more comfortable with that too because if you go R16 then you have owners also to the east saying, well, they're doing it, they're building their smaller lots right there, set a precedence. How many fewer lots would that be? I'm wondering probably. if the applicant might want to speak to some of this. I uh, would love to have, should we have Let's them have come now? And yeah. We can ask some of these questions directly to him. How's it going? Uh, Nate Heaps, I uh, am a partner of the applicant. The landowner wasn't able to make it tonight. Um, so a couple of my thoughts as uh, I appreciate the discussion. It's been great. Um, we have, I've met with uh, Dave a few times. And we've met with DRC, I think three times now to try and figure out the best use for a small parcel like this. Cause we agreed it was, you know, you're kind of putting it on an island. Um, so as we looked at it, it was, it was difficult to try and uh, figure out, you know, the highest and best use for it um, as a developer. And then also from the city standpoint. Um, and I feel like we worked through several different iterations. 
We had a down to a three lot concept up to townhomes, which in our first DRC meeting, we all agreed that that was that wouldn't be a you know, that's not the best use for it. Cramming, you know, a bunch of units onto a small two acre site on a large UDOT road, busy UDOT road um, just wasn't the fit. And then, you know, as going to the opposite end of the spectrum, um, going to a two or three lot subdivision, it just with the access, it, it wasn't it wasn't fitting. We weren't able to lay it out. Engineers looked at it. We all looked at it and it just it wasn't making any sense because of the access points, as Brandon uh, had mentioned. So the reason we went to the R16 um, was to get um, not to necessarily push our density, though it is compliant with general plan. Um, we felt like that was the best use um, for the property. Um, the as you go into like a 9000 square foot, it just it doesn't lay out right. You kind of pull into a road and it just doesn't feel cohesive um, as a neighborhood. Um, whereas if you go down to the 6,000 square foot lots, you drive in, um, and obviously we have the extension. We've uh, had talks with DRC about making sure that there was an extension that would eventually go through um, the Smith property um, if they ever decided to, if that's what they wanted to do. And then uh, there was a DRC meeting where we talked about the, I believe it's the Williams property, the larger property there. Um, eventually it would stub into that, um, which would create a second access um, into that, whatever, whatever large uh, master plan community that would be. Um, that was all high level discussion. And so that's how we ended up on the R16. I understand it's out on an island. I understand it's not necessarily um, touching anything. The Smith property, if they ever did develop, my, my guess is it would need to likely follow the R16 as well. I think that would be the logical uh, idea there and give it a cohesive feel that would then spit into the Williams larger, I think it's, I think it's 70 or 80 acres or something like that. Um, and that, you know, that's its own thing. So we, we did, um, for what it's worth, we did spend quite a bit of time. We put together several different concepts to try and figure out what the best use was. Um, and it did come back to, to this site plan, which we also agreed with was, you know, it maybe gives a little bit more of affordable option. Um, in that area. I know there's a ton of development out to the east, but that's kind of where we uh, landed. So that's what we thought we would present. Okay, thank you. Um, that, that's questions? Really helpful. Yeah. Uh, what do you anticipate the square footage of the houses being on those lots? Um, anywhere between. So so I'm, I do all the land development for my partner who's the landowner and he does all the verticals and he um, right now there have plans right between 25 and 4,000 square feet. So you're looking, you know, you're you're more expensive than a townhome, but you're less expensive than, you know, a 9,000 or 12,000 square foot lot. Uh, it gives you, you know, a little bit more flexibility and affordability there. As I look at this, I think uh, we've been excited to uh, get our general plan updated and stuff, and to be uh, to be pretty strict about adherence to it. However, I think that we have to be aware of certain sizes of lots and different uh, setups like we've got here where what is the best use of the land. Um, this pocket here is something that uh, we've had in the past where we've had some of these things happen. and. Uh, We've gone ahead and approved them, looking at them from the holistic approach of, well, what do you do with that then that is that makes sense to not only the city but to the owners of the property and the opportunity that it presents to the people who will buy these lots. Uh, yeah, it, it's a smaller, they're smaller lots. They'll be smaller homes. But by the same token, like we were talking about, this view shows it pretty well that where the trees are now, uh, I think that's the first homes that were built in Legacy Park, and they're very small lots, and they're there. And uh, we've tried to make the rest of this whole area kind of conform to what we thought Legacy was going to be in the first place, and that's larger lots. And I like that for the entire, the entire rest of this, but as we look at the map, and look at that. I mean, we're going to be dealing with large sections of ground that are, uh, they can build whatever they want there, you know. 
you, you know, you'll probably have some people that are going to want to have a little bit of higher density there. That's not what we're, that's not what, I don't think that the city has a vision of doing that with the rest of that property. I think we'll probably end up staying with larger lots and larger homes. And so this little piece here, what do we do with it because of the odd shape? The, we don't have the same kind of uh, access to it you would on a standard city street. This is a highway uh, that uh, it, it kind of makes sense to me that uh, we, we go along with what uh, the property owner and, and the staff has approved or would, uh, has stated that they would like to see here uh, because of those reasons that uh, it's an odd shaped property. And if you only had three houses in there, what what do those lots look like? And what, how do you share that street? And does it end up being a city street or is it a private street? You know, the, the, now you've got some issues that could come up too. And so I think that from my point of view, this is probably the best use for this piece of property. And uh, I agree with I agree with Joseph that uh, the zoning as it is is a bit of a problem. But, uh, and I don't want to set a precedent. That's the other thing. I don't want to set a precedent that uh, we have a property owner on further east that says, well, you did it there. We're going we're gonna to just devel develop this little four acre piece and we'll do the same thing. But I don't think that that's the same issue that we'll, you know, I mean, that's why, that's why we have hearings and that's why we look at things. And we don't want to be so rigid that nothing else can be done on that property. So the, the zoning as it is is AE. What Joseph is referring to is the master plan. Yes. Or it's medium density and R6 being the the smallest lots in that medium density. But the zoning currently is AE. Yeah. Yes. And I'm referring to the zoning map. Hopefully you're all seeing right. that, aware of that. What's currently zoned around it. Mm -hmm. Right. Okay. And uh, yeah. And one point with that, to just differ a little bit, John, from your comments, is we just previous to this applicant had uh, the Hardy uh, development that was a smaller lot. They came in uh, months ago, got recommendations for us for what we'd like to see on that lot. We gave them recommendations, and they complied with it. This, to my knowledge, is the first time I'm seeing this one. True. I, I have concerns with this size. I would have given feedback to them. I would love to have seen your other designs for a townhomes, three lots, whatever they were. That would have been that would be interesting to see, to see which, you know, in my opinion, which is just one of a board, uh, what would work best for the city. Um, I, I, since we often have those meetings where we give ideas and comments on things that are coming before us, I think that was could have been a missed opportunity with this one being unique. Yeah. Um, That's understood there. I, I will make one comment. All, we, no. we went into DRC, I think it was back in February, mm -hmm. and I've been working very closely with DRC sure. and, and following DRC procedures. I would have loved to present all our concepts to you. Mm -hmm. I think uh, as, you know, as the property owner, developer, and then city staff, we just, you know, uh, we were following essentially what was presented to us and what we were asked of. So I, I didn't mean that to be a criticism of at all. No, no, I'm, 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 I'm all it's ears. Kind of I'm, opportunity on my side. Yeah, I, I'm all ears. I think, you know, we, I, th I think we took it. We took advantage of that time period to really understand what the best use was. Mm -hmm. um, and I, you know, up to this point, I thought we, you know, we kind of had worked through it um, substantially and and figured out that that was the best uh, site plan to bring to mm -hmm. Planning Commission City Council. I, th I think on an R19 MPD, I I'm optimistic you could still have six residential lots. You, it, it, I mean, I, five, I, you might be able to do five. I do understand what you're saying. We, I mean, with our engineer, we worked through a lot, and it just the way it lays, lays or lays out with our with our depths that we have to get with turnarounds. It just it was really wonky. It didn't feel like a cohesive neighborhood. It just kind of felt it felt like we were just you know slapping a band aid on a small little section. It just didn't feel give it a neighborhood feel. The MPD allows for variances on some of those setback requirements you're mentioning, just so you know. Okay, great. I will, uh, yeah, we'll take note of that. And I think going back to what I was just mentioning to Todd, I think what we did is we, you know, we hashed it out up front with the DRC and, you know, essentially followed procedures according to what they had suggested we did. Um, 
which is kind of how we ended up where we were. Sure. The, the hardest thing with the smaller lots, the few, or sorry, larger lots was having turnaround, mm -hmm. um, having clearance from the UDOT road. That was, that killed us. I mean, Byron knows that, that, that was the hardest part going that direction. Um, so that's, again, like I said, that's kind of how we ended up where we were. Yeah. And the idea would be eventually, um, you know, I, I believe the property owner, and I, I believe the Smiths are here. Um, the property owner has talked to the Smiths about potentially um, developing into their land in the future. And then, uh, like I said, with DRC, we, we talked about punching it into the Williams property and eventually tying that all in. So it was, you know, growing the community rather than feeling like you're just cramming something into a, into a small corner. So I appreciate the comments. I'd be interested to hear from the neighboring landowners if they'd be. Is that appropriate? Well, I believe there's public hearing. Public hearing. Public hearing. So. Oh, public hearing. <laughs> oh, good. Yeah. Oh, it will be. Anyways, good. there's no further. Do you questions. have any other comments for us, or do any of the commissioners? No, nope. I, uh, I appreciate you uh, taking the time and, and looking at it. And uh, anyways, thanks. Okay. We may call you back up. We'll thanks. see how this yeah. public hearing goes. Mr. Chairman, thanks for your perspective. Sure, one other thought. Please. Well, we have before you address this day one. Uh, to, I apologize. Didn't mean to interrupt, but. Um, I really appreciate the discussion. I think this is great. I think you're you're talking about the right things. I'm just going to share my perspective as staff on a couple of the things that you've raised. And incidentally, I think there are a lot of different options at your disposal. And um, it would not be hard to um, very solidly justify any one of them. Uh, we've been talking a lot about the medium density uh, general plan designation and Commissioner Ernest has pointed out that the R16 zone is kind of the most dense single family zone that fits in a range of zones that are consistent with that designation. So I'm just kind of stating the obvious maybe, but um, of course R18, R19 zone as well are consistent with that designation and certainly I think are worth considering and appreciate the conversation you've had relative to that. Um, maybe more importantly for me, the idea of setting a precedent here, uh, particularly in the context of the property that's east of this, I view them as being very, very distinct, even though they're next to one another. And that would certainly influence, likely will influence, um, the recommendation that we make as staff when, and I think it probably will be sooner than later, um, a development pr proposal is brought to the Planning Commission. Um, the only zone changes that have been granted going east of this property in recent years have been for R112 zoning or, or larger. Um, we had a conversation about the property at the corner of Slant Road and um, uh, Fourth North just maybe a year ago. Mm -hmm. And I think the commission set, um, or rather provided a clear message about what you'd like to see there. And, you know, it was, it was bigger lots um, where you can easily accommodate, for example, in our 112 subdivision to the east of this. Um, I, I feel like that's a pretty straightforward kind of situation given the general plan designation that that exists there and you know again kind of the history that we have with recent zone changes and developments in the area um, and I think this area could be viewed as distinct from that like I said um, this is redevelopment you know where you're talking about this property where right now there's one home on it um, there's not a lot of a lot of things you could do given what's been talked about the criteria that UDOT has provided relative to where the access can be um, uh, the inability to tie in to the property to the north um, to make a street layout more efficient than what we have with a really big cul-de-sac and different things like that I don't know if that helps but um, I, maybe most importantly for me when we look at proposals for the property to the east, I think, uh, regardless of what this is zoned, um, we're going to be expecting an R112 subdivision. Okay, thank you. Sorry to cut you off there for a minute. Please come up and address us. Do you want to officially? Oh, yeah. We're opening up public hearing. 
Thank you for So I'm Jordan Smith. That. I'll represent Brent. Um, so I guess the biggest... Can you uh, say your name, please? Uh, Jordan Smith. Okay, thank you. So I guess the biggest thing that I have concern is, is where we're just talking about the previous lot, you know, blending in with everything else, and now we're saying we want to build an island between this house and the rest of the houses where they've all got these big, large lots, right? So being the person living next to that weird island is kind of a concern to me. And then also, I live in an R1 neighborhood, and there's nowhere to park. So you go into that cul-de-sac, there's cars going to be everywhere, you can't plow it, you can't do any of that. And it looks like just kind of like I said, painted into a corner. It's odd, looks weird. You drive down the road, there's houses facing it this way, facing it that way. I mean, it's just the concept of how what it looks like, right? So I think it needs to be zoned to the bigger lots. That's how I feel. I mean, we don't plan on adding on to this or wanting to go with the R6 as well. We plan on keeping the house there. We don't plan on uh, tearing it down and conjoining into what's already there if that happens. Well, your, your Where is your is residence? Are you yeah. 1591? So right there on the east you're side. You're 1591, not 1429? Yeah, so we're the one directly east. Okay. And you have no desire to sell at this time or develop? How much, no, I think How much ground do you, do you have with your house? There's a full acre. So, like I said, it's just going to be a weird oddity that's going to sit there for maybe years, 20 years. Maybe it'll eventually go to something, but not in our legacy. It will stay. Mm. So, the, yeah. Is your agree. house on their site plan? No, no. it's not. It's no. adjacent to it. I get it. All right. So like I said, and we'll have a weird, yeah. Anyway, <laughs> it's a weird envelope. It's a weird lot. It's a weird situation, but that's kind of our feeling is. Very good. Who wants to live by the island? I guess nobody, right? Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. My name's uh, Mike Ulrich, and we live on the the other side, the 1429. Um, and I, I think adding new homes is a great idea, but I like the idea of having maybe less lots, because that is that is a lot crammed in there and. And that, the, the concern of parking on the street, that was kind of the concern I had. If you have that, that many homes in one circle, then people are going to end up parking in the street, and you won't, you won't have the turnaround access that you need anyway. So that's all. You in 14, 1429 or west of 1429? Yeah, we're 1429. Okay. Yeah. And we don't have any plan on selling either, ever. <laughs> Just throwing that out there. Oh, that's beautiful. That's such a great, Thanks. yeah. Thank you. Anybody else have any comments on this topic? Okay, we'll close the public hearing. Commissioners, anybody have any further comments for staff or for the applicant after we've had the public hearing, or if you've had or after you've had a chance to gather more thoughts? None, none for staff. But I'm just sometimes you have a, an initial reaction when you do the research, and then you try and maybe talk yourself out of it to try to accommodate a really nice applicant, which is what I've been trying to do, but I find myself reaffirmed in my initial reaction after doing all of the research. So for, for me, for what it's worth, I would, I'm in favor of an R19 zone, which is consistent with the surrounding area. Um, I'd even entertain an R19 with an MPD, but R16 is just not consistent with the surrounding area and be spot zoning. And two neighbors, the ones that are the most affected, both to the west and the east, that actually abut this project, have asked us to just be consistent. I think that's kind of what I heard. Um, and I, I'm inclined to oblige. Now, Those are my thoughts. And this, but this part was brought up earlier that we had an infill overlay that we had asked to conform with the neighborhood. This does not have that requirement, but the same requirement as an infill overlay would. But I'm just bringing that up, but that's not really a requirement. We specify for this zone change, but your comments are, that, that, that's great. Any other comments? I have a question for staff. Um, can you speak to the, um, the concerns about the larger lots as you are all looking at this? That's a good we question. heard from, we heard from the applicant about their concerns, but I would I would like to hear from staff. And they in the DRC they would have seen the other yes the other options that came out. Yeah, yeah. great question. 
speaker if I jump in? No concerns. You know, R18, R19 zoning, it's consistent with the general plan. It's more a matter of um, do we view R16 as a problem? Um, they were able to lay it out, you know, to meet our, our zoning requirements for a standard subdivision. Um, if anything, we have a tendency as staff to defer to an applicant's request, but uh, um, no concerns with other zoning, you know, of the site. Does that help? I mean, it's kind of that cut and dry, I think. Okay. And, and one more question uh, to speak to the concerns if they're parking in that cul-de-sac, the ability to turn around. Maybe you can speak to that. If, if that will cause issues if people are parking on the street. Yeah, it would. Um, our minimum cul-de-sac standard is to back a walk. It's 96 feet, and it's, it's set up for a fire truck to turn around. And so, yeah, if you get cars parked in there, it definitely will affect that. Is parking allowed on uh, 4th North? In other words, if parking is not available in this uh, in this subdivision, uh, would would people be able to park on Fourth North? Kind of like we have on Canyon Road. Uh, Canyon Fourth Road, North. we see that already. Right. <laughs> um, you don't see a lot of parking, and, and we don't have red curb out there or no right. signs. But I don't think. I think you don't see it because there's not really a shoulder in most areas. But if there was a shoulder, yeah, they could park there. I think it'd be a horrible precedent to have parking there yeah. for just about every reason you can think of. I don't think we want uh, that we want parking on Fourth North on either side. That is one of our arterial roads that uh, not only do we need plenty of room, but we need a lot of good vision and uh, safety on that. There's a pickup that's, that's parked there, I guess, but, you know, uh, we, we can't widen that road much more. Correct. Uh, so that is a concern if the parking isn't available in that cul-de-sac, where does it go? I think one thing that was said, uh, uh, a concern was what do you do with the snow, which is a concern every year for snow removal i i do see where that they have uh put uh a provision to go east with that road like they're saying and that might be where you could pile snow but that's not what you do with a with with a snow plow you know you don't very often uh do a custom snow plow job with a big city truck to try and push that snow all the way out there. It's, you know, when the truck goes through, it's gonna just push it up onto the sidewalk and it'll get smaller and smaller like every other cul-de-sac. And right now that'd be right. pushing it onto the Residences. Smith's backyard. So. <laughs> <laughs> so that's an issue as well. My concerns echo Joseph's. I mean, almost, yeah, a bit. I think there, I would like to have seen some other options on this, see how it lays out, see if it's, there is a one that's more palatable to me. Um, just because it fits doesn't mean it's a reason why I want to go forward. So there's no more comments. I'll entertain a, a motion from commissioners. This is just on the plot or the zone change at this point? This is just on the zone change, yes. I move the planning commission recommends denial of the Zion's landing zone change to R16. Second. I have a motion and a second. All in favor? Aye. 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 Any opposed? Nay. So I have five, four, and one against. The motion does not carry. Well, it carries. Well, yeah, yeah, the motion Car carries. The motion yes, yes, the motion carries. It's just not unanimous. It's, it's, yeah. I was thinking in a positive sense. 
but yes. Um, the city council may be interested. It's up to you on Michelle's feedback on her vote. I, I think they like that if you want to, because they'll listen. Yeah. Probably. Yeah, um, we have a housing shortage and we need um, some affordable single family homes available to our community members. And I am a proponent, proponent of single family homes that are affordable on smaller lots. Thank you. Um, next steps, Dave? Yeah, great question. I'm trying to think that through. The Planning Commission is the land use authority on standard subdivisions. Um, without the zoning in place, you could not approve a preliminary plat. So your options would be, I think they could, they could deny it because the zoning currently is not in place. Or you but it could. wouldn't have been in place anyway had we... Pardon me? It wouldn't have been in place anyway had we been unanimously in favor. It's up to the city council. Yeah, so thank you. I think, so I'm picturing, like Mr. Snyder said, continuance. Of on the, the preliminary plat? Or the preliminary plat. Or so the continue proposal. the preliminary plat till after the city council meeting. Or you could clearly... Um, go ahead and make a motion tonight to deny it. The difference there would be that um, should the city council approve the R16 zone, then it, the applicant would it doesn't change would start the, over. It doesn't change the timing on the process either way. It, it might take a little bit longer yeah. if you move tonight to deny and we kickstart things. Um, continuing it probably lets us be a little bit more nimble to get it back on an agenda, agenda for approval. Um, more beneficial or beneficial to the applicant. I'm in favor of that. If it's more beneficial to the applicant, it also saves them money in a new application and all yeah, that. Yeah, things like that. Because if city council disagrees with the majority of us and agrees with Michelle, then it would be a permitted plat. And that's a different vote. So in this, um, it sounds unnatural to say, but I think still a viable option would be to approve the preliminary plat subject to the city council changing the zoning to R16. Um, it's a little bit contradictory, but I think that's a viable action if you wanted to go that route. I like continuing. I like the continuing. <laughs> continuing saves, if if we're going to deny it, then it continuing saves. Saves them process time. I move that we continue the uh, Zion's Landing preliminary plot. Uh, Bef the, before we do that, we'll have to rescind what we just did. No. No, no. Right? no, no. we don't. No, it's perfect. Because it's a different thing. The That's right. The preliminary plot is contingent on the zoning change. Okay. Not the other way around. Okay. We're good. Shelly's good. But is that a motion, or is that just, do we just make a decision to? I think it's a motion. Yeah. Make that motion yeah. again. Okay. I move that we continue item 7A, the Zion's Landing Preliminary Plot. Second. A motion a second. All in favor? Aye. 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 Any opposed? Thank you. We will continue that until our next meeting, waiting on feedback from the council or, and maybe further direction, further options from the applicant and staff. Okay, that will move us into uh, Speaking of plat. single family homes on small lots. Yeah, we're, uh, the next item is the ridge at the Spanish Fork. Is Who's going to speak to this one? I'd be happy to. Um, Ian left the room, so I don't feel like I'm teasing him. But his enthusiasm, I don't know if you noticed that at the beginning. This was his first time presenting an item. Uh, so he was doing a lot of preparation this afternoon. I appreciated it. He had a lot more questions than I think we heard tonight. But don't tell him I said that. Um, <laughs> Sorry, I was just well, making, hope he doesn't listen to the broadcast. <laughs> <laughs> I was just making some notes on this last item. This one, I hate to say that it's rather straightforward, but this would be, um, if we looked at the rest of the agenda items, this is an existing project that I would say is maybe 80% built out. Unfortunately, the applicant has not recorded a phase um, to keep the approval vested and continued. And so what he's basically asking tonight is to uh, reinstate the approvals for the, the project so that he can continue to finish the last uh, few phases. So this is for the ridge. Um, it's up on 2725 East Canyon Road. 
the overall project was just over 20 acres um, with just over 200 units. Um, this has been uh, looked at a number of times in the past um, with his first uh, iteration of the project that he got approvals on. There's since been some phases added, for instance, phase number six that you see on the screen. That was one of the later um, additions to the project. Um, but what we're looking at is just reinstating the, the existing approvals for the uh, project so that the applicant continu can continue on and finish off the remaining phases. Is, can I ask a question? Is phase six, is that townhomes or little single family homes? Uh, those are smaller single family. Is little the wrong way to say that? <laughs> A little smaller. There's been no changes to this since the last time we've seen it. I believe no changes. I'm looking at in the back. Um, no. I remember the time we went through it, didn't I think you just said this. Yeah. We went over this several times in, in several different meetings. Yeah. So over the years, and maybe Matt, you'll remember better than I do. I think phase six, he had picked up the property. Phase mm -hmm. seven, he also picked up the property. And those that kind of took place after the original yeah. uh, first few phases up there by the neighborhood Walmart. Mm -hmm. And so the, the version that you're seeing here is just a, a reapproval of what was last approved by the Planning Commission and City Council. So as the properties were, were acquired by the developer, we were able to create a better flow and mixture of housing that was in it correct so no no changes to the zoning no modifications to the layout any of those things okay. any questions for Brandon do we want to speak to the applicant would the applicant like to come up and address us Thank you for being here. Appreciate it. You can state your name. Uh, Matt Brown with MW Brown Engineering. Great. Just trying to get this thing done. It's been I don't know how many years, huh, Dave? <laughs> <laughs> so there's 24 townhomes left to be built mm -hmm. on the access down and then the, the single family. So. Okay. Any questions that you want to go over with him? Of the 206, 24 of those are townhomes? Uh, left. Okay. 24 left. I don't know how many townhomes there was in the phases one through five. Oh, okay. The re and the rest are single family? Yes. Okay. Nothing. That's very simple. No concern. Yep. Thank you. This is not a public hearing, so the only thing left is if any of the commissioners have any thoughts or comments. I'm in favor of it. Uh, somebody like to present a motion? I move that we approve that the proposed preliminary plat be approved based on the findings and subject to the conditions. Second. Great. I have a motion and a second. All in favor? Aye. 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 Any opposed? Thank you. Motion. The next off uh, agenda item is the El Dorado Platte. So these next two um, preliminary plats are both industrial um, locations. This first one is just off of 1000 North, uh, approximately 450 West. So to the east on the corner, um, the city has a, a power substation. And then to the west, um, we've got the Hall Industrial Subdivision, um, which has the Daybell Warehouse and the, I'm drawing a blank on the name of the buildings right next door, but they were recently uh, uh, built. Um, El Dorado, what they're looking to do is come in and take this this property that abuts there uh, along I-15, and they're going to split it into two um, two industrial lots. One would be directly south of those warehouses to the west, and the larger lot would be there fronting on to 1,000 north. The rear lot would have access via a shared 
uh, and partially improved um, uh, paved access um, that was done with the I'm still drawing a blank on those warehouses. Coleman. Coleman thank you. So Coleman, um, they installed part of the access, and then Wheeler will finish off the rest of the access that will provide access to the back. Um, what the applicant is also accomplishing with the plat is there's some road dedication, and then obviously you can see some easements that would uh, uh, allow utilities and access uh, throughout the site. Um, this is in, in preparation for Wheeler machinery would be locating on the property excuse me the larger lot would have um, their main uh, office and warehouse uh, as well as the uh, storage and display of their uh, machinery that they sell um, and then the smaller lot would actually have uh, I believe the rental office um, for those running them the equipment um, DRC did look at it rather straightforward uh, to two lots on 17 acres and recommend approval the the other access for the back lot is that this right here no um, let me borrow that pointer that's just a utility easement so the uh, main access is right here okay so, so the that's Coleman all the warehouses the sit right okay. there and the shared access is here um, you see and the satellite then, view can you show me that on the satellite view yes Just go directly. Oh, it just does that. Thousand North, fourth, uh, fourth west. So south. Yes. So this is the property right there, here. There you go. Yep. So if you can zoom in, you can see the majority of the access is already in. Right there. Zoom out a little bit, Ian. Yeah. Okay, perfect. Perfect, right there. So the substation. Straightforward. Yes. So the larger lot they're separating from this one, the yep. access will be right Correct. here. Correct. Yes. Okay. Simple. Yeah. Any comments for staff? Nope. Any Thank comments? Do we want any questions for the applicant? Do we want Shauna? Do you have a question? Is the applicant here? That's just that's close to the where we just approved the. It's concrete. just south. It's yeah. probably about a mile south. Gotcha. So this is I-15. Right. This that's is third west, third west, where it comes underneath the gotcha. right okay. there's a substation okay. storage over and here. And the one that we approved is just be, north of that. Yeah. Okay. On that road. <coughs> Same road, just uh, down the road tracks. Okay. Hi, I'm Taylor Smith with Galloway. We're the engineers and architects on this project. Do you have any questions for Taylor? It seems no, like a pretty. What's it? I think you're off the hook. Maybe. Wait, it's know. zoned right. It's we're not changing a zone. We're just doing a. Preliminary yeah, it's currently outside. zoned light industrial. I guess my other question is just what's the impact to the neighbors that are right there to the north? Is that a fair question right now but to the north there that question it's a fair question the sites laid out actually rather well um, the majority of the parking stalls will be along 1000 north a uh, healthy landscape buffer uh, trail system that will be extended so the actual building is I would guess at least a hundred feet back at least a hundred feet road. back landscape buffer if the trail um, improved right away um, and that front building is going to be dressed up really nice with light, the kind of lights and displaying the machinery and everything. Um, okay. So we have the site plan that's we're working on right now. I'm just finishing with Dave on some red lines on that, and that will be done here shortly. We've already submitted for, we're getting ready for submit for building permit, so. Stand up concrete building. Yes. Okay. Yeah, so I'm going to jump in if you don't mind, and not to minimize approving the preliminary plat, but frankly, a site plan's been approved that, you know, with a couple of corrections, a few corrections being made, we'll be able to issue a building permit, um, whether the property be kept in one parcel or subdivided, um, that is sort of irrelevant as to, you know, what the development on the site ends up looking like and that type of a thing. And maybe my plug for 
the impact that this would have for some of the neighbors in the area. Um, there will be some badly, in my opinion, badly needed road improvements made, mm-hmm. you know, to the south side of 10th North to tie That's into really what's true. happened to the west, which I think um, will be a good thing. Oh. And I th- we just bonded for those actually yesterday. So, okay, thank you. That's your question. Yes, thank you. Oh, okay, we're good. Thank you. If there's no other comments or questions, I'll entertain a motion. I move that we uh, approve the proposed preliminary plat based on the findings and conditions. I have a motion to have a, I have a motion and a second. Sorry, Chairman. No, that's <laughs> great. I love when you do that. Um, I have a motion and a second. All in favor? Aye. 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 Any opposed? Thank you. Motion passes. The Sky Park Phase 1. <laughs> that Brandon, are you going to take that one also? Uh, yes. Um, I just realized leading up to this one, um, what we failed to include in your staff report, and it's not necessarily tied to the current request tonight, but there is an overall master plan um, that the, the applicant has provided. This is just the first phase in it. Um, this is Sky Park Phase 1, uh, approximately 1100 north, 1150 west, so just uh, further west and a little bit north um, than what we were just looking at. Um, this area is unique in the sense that when it was recently annexed, we did have two annexation agreements, the Oberg annexation and the Utah West, which kind of laid the expectations for what backbone utility and road improvements would be needed um, for this area to develop. Um, it is zoned industrial, so the expectation um, there was that we would anticipate industrial development. Um, what the applicant's looking for tonight is approval of a preliminary plat for three lots. You can kind of see it on this right image here, um, lot one, lot two, lot three. Um, shown here on the plat as well. Let's go to the next picture. This kind of shows the backbone improvements for the area, and this is important. We highlight it in condition number six, which basically references and acknowledges that there are pre existing annexation agreements that have uh, expectations that need to be met as far as timing of improvements and what improvements are needed. Um, so, once again, this first phase, if we're looking at this map, um, is located right here. With this phase, we would have a relocation of the road, which would give more spacing from the railroad crossing. Um, and we do anticipate uh, additional phases in the future. Uh, so, once again, the step tonight is preliminary plat approval for phase one, which would comprise three lots. Uh, we would recommend that the approval be based on the findings and the conditions listed there. Um, these conditions were talked at length uh, with the DRC and with the applicant. Um, we would be more than happy to uh, clarify or comment on any questions you have or um, thoughts. Seems pretty straightforward. Brandon, what is condition seven? Could you? Explain that a little bit to me that the improvements be completed prior to the issuance of a certificate of occupancy in the Sky Park or Hamilton Partner projects. Yeah, that's a great question. So, um, if we go back a few slides to the backbone one, this one here. So, Hamilton is these properties right here to the east, and then phase one is right here. So, the expectation is that. Um, the improvements needed to serve those developments would need to be completed prior to CFO. We anticipate uh, 12 to 16 month build time for the buildings and so the idea is that there would be some work on site as 
con consecutive with the off-site work, the, the public impro improvement, excuse me. Um, but there is the expectation that those improvements would need to be completed before the city would be allowing occupancy. But all of those conditions are completed before either property gets Correct. their CFO. Yes, so they're, they're tied in this together. Yes, Hamilton is, I don't know how to better say it, but they're reliant on Skyparks yes. improvements. Yes, okay. And vice versa, right? You know, it's, it's not good. No. Any questions? No, it's not like that. Do you want to hear from the applicant on this, or? If they want to say anything. If you want to address this, we'd love to hear from you. How's it going? Ben Seastrand with the Gardner Group. Um, happy to be here tonight, and it's been kind of a long time coming. We've been involved and in, in working on the site for over two years now um, since we acquired it. Um, I think, like, like you said, hopefully the, the application is fairly straightforward. I think there's kind of that long list of conditions that we'll, we'll continue to work on and work through and continue to work with Hamilton Partners, who are our neighbors, as you mentioned. We're, we're these, we both need the same backbone infrastructure, which is it's kind of nice. We, we lean on each other to, to get it done. It's just a matter of timing. Um, and lastly, just honestly, uh, thanks to staff for, I mean, Dave, Byron, everyone. It's been a, a big lift to get the, not, not just this preliminary plot, but the backbone infrastructure, all of those plans completed, reviewed. Um, it's been a big lift. So happy, other than that, just happy to you know, answer any questions you may have or anything else on the project. Welcome to Spanish Fork. Thank you. We're <laughs> happy to be here. No other comments? I'll entertain a motion. Whose turn is it? <laughs> Take a turn. <laughs> Take a <Joseph>. turn. <laughs> I move that the Planning Commission approves the proposed preliminary plot of Sky Park Phase 1 subject to compliance with staff's findings and conditions. Second. second. A motion and a second. All in favor? Aye. 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 Any opposed? I was, I was hoping to get the AstroTurf one, but. Uh. <laughs> All right. Uh, Mr. Chair, may I also do one more introduction while Dave's walking up to the podium? Sure. We have, a, we have our youth city council representative. We're, this is your second month here with us. For, is that right, Owen? Uh, yes. Okay, introduce yourself, Owen. Um, is this on? Uh, I'm Owen Young. I'm from the Spanish Fork Youth City Council. I am the um, Planning Commission Officer. Uh, it's my job to come to these meetings and just kind of take notes on what's happening, and then I get to inform the, the rest of the council on what's happening in the city, and then I also get speakers to come to our meetings. But, yeah, happy to be here. Glad to have Welcome. You. Very good. Welcome. Thank you. Okay, thank you. This is a proposed text amendment. I'm going to be as quick as I can be and say that this proposal to allow artificial turf, which currently our code requires live turf grass or other types of ground covering, um, and does not allow for what we're talking about here. Um, this proposal, which we have been discussing for a number of months, would allow for the use of artificial turf in front and side yards that are visible from streets uh, in the same quantity, um, which is up to 35% of that particular space. Um, that's how much we allow people to cover with uh, live turf grass today. Um, the limit that we have on live turf grass is the result of changes that were approved a year ago um, as part of a much bigger discussion about uh, working with our residents to install landscaping that uses less water. So um, that's the long and short of what is proposed here, part of making an allowance for something like artificial turf uh, generally ties to defining that item. Um, we have made, I think, uh, and I, I appreciate uh, Mr. Bunker's work in helping us come up with a definition that um, is a, it's a, not only a 
great definition, but potentially a great start as well. Even though we've been working on this, like I said, for a number of months, uh, we don't have an expert on artificial turf on our staff. Uh, we've talked to landscape architects that we've talked to before about different things. And um, we continue to learn, um, which I mention uh, simply by way of there is a chance that even before this gets to the city council in a couple of weeks, we might want to make a few adjustments to the definition if we believe there are ways to improve that. And even maybe, you know, over the course of future months and years, as whatever it might be, the technology changes or best practices change or that type of a thing, we might be back to, uh, to request other changes uh, to be made on the topic. The last thing I want to mention, um, this has been reviewed by the Development Review Committee. We've discussed it in, in that forum um, a few times. And uh, um, the DRC has recommended that this be approved, again, kind of with the understanding that if there are ways to improve the language um, in some way, we're going to try to take advantage of that. Um, one thing I'll mention to provide, hopefully succinctly, a little bit more of a description about what we hope this results in and what, if somebody follows this, it would result in. Um, it would be uh, individual residential yards um, that choose to use artificial turf, using that over a portion of their yards, but also installing landscaping that would have live plant material. It would have shrubbery, bushes, trees, different things like that. So um, it wouldn't be a sterile you know, look or actually a sterile kind of an environment. Um, there would be things um, planted in yards that would help maybe offset some of the things that we understand are negative um, impacts of using uh, artificial surfaces like artificial turf, things that just generally make communities hotter and the like. Um, so as proposed, I think this is a, it's a good balance between the things that historically we've tried to do with our landscaping requirements and an allowance for something that's new. Have you seen this particular type of astroturf? It's very specific, one and a half inches, uh, two different colors with a tan or beige under color. Does it look good, this particular one? I mean, we're specific here. Well, it's, it's not calling out a particular one. That was one of my comments is, but is why it, don't we specify, in other places of the city, we specify a different in utilities, you know, this um, product. Why wouldn't that be a good addition to this to say similar to XYZ AstroTurf that meets this criteria? That is an option. Um, Ian and I were on a call was that last week? Okay, late last week, with a landscape architect, uh, a, um, a very, very good professional who I trust. And he basically said, this is the product that you should require people to use. And of course, that comes with the caveat of, you know, or like quality or mm -hmm. something like that. Um, I think that's on the table for sure. Um, between now and the city council meeting, I'd like to touch base with a couple of other people to get there. And when I say other people, I'm talking about uh, either landscape architects, somebody I have in mind, a manufacturer even, mm -hmm. um, about the prospect of maybe zeroing in on things a little bit more tightly that way. We often so, have items like that spec. It's they'll call out the spec of what the product, yeah, what the lands, what the art, uh, artificial turf is, and like you're saying, alike. Um, alternate is acceptable, but it has to be approved. But the, to answer Joseph's question, I'm, I know it was asked me, but on a lot of our projects, we have some that look horrible. They're, they're astro, the artificial turf, looks like the old astro turf, and others that uh, it looks like grass. It looks very nice. Well, and that's kind of, Todd, your comment's interesting because I'm interpreting this as you can use lawn or artificial turf. And then the city goes through a paragraph of defining what artif artificial turf is. So I'm interpreting this that the city is going to say, nope, that's not artif artificial turf. You need to rip it out because it's not 1.5 inches and a mix of at least two shades of green. And it, and it has crumb rubber, which you can't have. 
and then it has to have a, a base of some tan, which is I'm not opposed to. So which is why why my question was, has someone seen this? Mm-hmm. It's we're very. I feel like we're being specific, which is great. Does it look good? I, it look from the description, it, I have no reason to believe it doesn't. I was just curious if you've seen it. We've seen it. And honestly, I mean, I think it's um, you're asking a subjective question, right? I mean, it's a matter of opinion as to. Uh, how things look. Laws this, are usually subjective when they first start out, and then you write them down. And then, <laughs> well, um, and I'll point out, Joseph, and I don't disagree with anything that you've said, but it's not quite as tight by way of, for example, on the height, minimum height of sure. one and a half inches. So, yeah. you know, and, and Ian's done the heavy lifting on looking into things. You can get one and a half, 1.75, two, yeah. two and a, you know, and so forth. And I think it's well thought out. But in the sense that you have a definition, I, I like that there's a definition because you can the city can say, no, you don't meet the def- definition of artificial turf. Right. Therefore, you need to plant lawn or meet the definition of artificial turf. And, you know, a lot of times we are writing definitions to try to preclude something as much as promote something. Mm-hmm. And yeah. really with this, um, and Ian, you can jump in anytime anybody can. But uh, we don't necessarily, well, I'll speak for myself and not say we. I'm concerned about what happens in neighborhoods when people just go to Lowe's and drag the stuff off of a roller and go home and put it on their yard. So we're trying to get to a point to where we're talking about a product that requires some kind of professional installation and has some type of, of backing that you don't get with that kind of product, um, you know, like you said, I mean, it, um, there are things that I have seen absolutely that I think look horrible mm-hmm. day one. And there are other things that uh, you would probably have to do a double or triple check to see if it is or is not artificial. So we just um, want to know if what is described in here is that <laughs> that is what we've tried for. Right. And we've tried to eliminate, you know, what. I would do if I was left to my own devices in my yard. That's not what we want. We want professional. So respect a product, it might help. My, my worry is I don't want a, a resident to be like, oh, they allow AstroTurf now and go to Lowe's yeah. and, and without going to bother reading the whole requirement. And then once it's in, they've got an expense. The city is in a situation of having to enforce something. It's a negative, whereas if we can spell it out maybe clearer that Along with not not removing the definition, along with the definition, yeah. um, I think that would be helpful. I think that is Especially a great. Especially if you have an architect, a landscape architect that already has a product that you base this on, it's very very easy to put a link to that. Right. I, I'm assuming that you hand. We've talked about this a long time ago, but I assume that you that when there's new homes built that have a yard that they are given something that is the guidelines for the lawn yards and lawns for the city we have resources that are available um part of the the conversation and boy we could take quite a while talking about this but um the ability that cities have to regulate what people do with their yards how they landscape them you know maybe what some of the consequences might be for not following rules like this um uh, to kind of restate, we don't have a lot of tools at our disposal right now by way of being able to enforce um, these types of regulations. Right. It just feels like if somebody's, if if it's a new home and you're sitting down and you're receiving a certificate of occupancy, that along with that, there's a city person giving you a brochure that says, and make sure that, it, you know. That's my whole thought. I mean, it, there's a lot of people here that will redo things that aren't with that, but at that very initial something seems like something the city could give right then. Anyway. So with that, we will look into the prospect of getting our residential landscape guidelines in the hands of new residents as quickly as we, we can. So that would probably be actually when they sign up for utilities. Oh, yeah. The certificates of occupancy generally are given to the home builders. And um, I think the effort's lost with them, but uh, via that channel. uh, You know, 
the other side of not being able to, I think, truthfully, effectively um, enforce landscape regulations, the power of persuasion, right? We've tried to give people examples of best practices, and we've tried to um, provide those resources. And I think uh, there are some excellent resources, by the way, available on the on the city's website for designing and constructing uh, local, you know, yard level landscapes. Um, but not everybody knows that unless they have a little thing when they sign up for utilities. So that's just a thought. We'll, we'll take a stab at that. I think that's a good, suge good suggestion. I think the only w loophole will be the person that uh, has, has had his second go around with grubs and has lost his lawn again and is going to <laughs> till it up and get rid of it and they're going to either bring in sod or replant and they see their neighbor who just built a year or two ago and they've got, uh, and they've got the turf. And so, like you say, they head for Lowe's or Home Depot and, and put in their own uh, product right over the top. And uh, we, the city won't know about that other than it's green there. And I guess that those kinds of things will probably, they won't last as long as the lawn did with the grubs. So I guess it's their own fault and they'll be tearing that up again too. But that is something different than a new construction. I think we need we need to really concentrate on the new construction. Like I think this is a good thing to do. So my takeaways: look at adding language relative to, and I can think that there might be a couple of different manufacturers and specs that we put in the code. I think that's great. That certainly is doable. You know, quickly. And the idea of, of promoting good practices via getting stuff in the hands of new residents as quickly as we can, we, we can do that. And think about, I mean, if there's any low work, low impact campaign that's easy to get something out to people generally in the, you know, in the general populace, did you know that the city has code for yard ex for what is allowed in your yard. I think that'd be the obligation of the resident as they're putting that stuff in to look that up. I, mean, yeah. I think a lot of people don't know, though. I guess they're subject to the penalties. Are they, though? Yes, but um, there are a lot of issues that we have to deal with, and that hasn't typically risen to the top of the pile. Um, you guys want me to be done? Just, just one more thought to what you said, Shauna. Uh, you know, the idea of, I mean, it's like a public service announcement kind of an effort. Right. With the WaterWise effort that we finished up last year, we took a stab working with SFCN to try to make, like, some commercials that they would run, basically, and that type of a thing. And, frankly, we kind of failed at that. But that's something that we could work to resuscitate. Um, I agree. And as much as we can get the word out and encourage people, our time is much better spent there than trying to get something fixed after somebody has, has made a mistake and that sort of a thing. So I hope that helps. That's it for me. You. Unless you have questions, more, anything. Thanks. Well, thanks. This is a public hearing. So if there's anybody here to address this topic, we'd love to hear from you. Seeing none, we'll close the public hearing. Uh, other comments or motion or discussion on the artificial turf? Make out a motion. I'll make the motion that we approve Title 15 Amendment for our artificial turf. Recommend for approval. Recommend and I second that. Thank you. A motion and a second. All in favor? Aye. 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 Any opposed? Great. Um, the second item is our sewage, uh, change to sewage facilities. Amendment to the sewage uh, siege requirements. Let's see in. 
So these are uh, two minor changes that we're proposing, staff's proposing to our code that talks about um, septic tanks, uh, really is what it's talking about. Um, we kind of looked at what some of the other cities are requiring as far as parcel size, um, and this is would be an existing lot. This isn't newer subdivisions or newer plats or anything, but um, our old code on item number six used to be one acre. Um, it seems like majority of the cities around here are, are a third of an acre or larger. Um, and so we've liked to make that code change. And then um, on item number four, the, the old co code used to only um, allow septic tank systems on one building on a, on a single lot. Um, we're starting to see an influx of ADUs, and some of these ADUs are in areas that the existing homes on a septic system. So um, we're proposing to, to allow a, a new ADU to have a, a new septic system also if it's if it's larger than a third of an acre and it's in a existing lot with the existing building on a septic system, so. So it's on the same parcel because it has its own septic system. Correct, yeah. And it's only for ADUs, not like okay. another home or anything larger. So it has to meet that ADU criteria. So. About how many homes or lots in Spanish Fork have septic systems? Um, not many, M more kind of in that Leland 900 South area. We've seen, I think there's two or three people, residents over there that want to add an ADU, and they're currently on septic systems. Um, and then probably a few west that are actually county right now, but in our future city boundary, so. Any other questions? No. Great. Thank you. Yeah. Okay. Um, again, public hearing. Anybody want to come and speak on this topic? Jason Rasmussen, Jackie, let me go first because she'll talk a lot longer than I will. <laughs> <laughs> you have three minutes. <laughs> um, I started this process, so I appreciate them changing it. I asked Chris, and I know he's not here anymore, and I was talking to him. Um, the only concern that I have, I'm on the night south and I asked for the ADU and did the research in the other cities to show this is what the standard is and that's why they're changing it. Perfect. So I do appreciate that. But on the concern that I have is my house sits 450 feet back to get back to where my septic tank is. It's about 600 feet, but if the sewer ever comes, it will touch my parcel right next to it and so the rule of the 300 feet is where I have a concern because I'm 600 feet back to where my septic is so I I don't like the wording and I asked Chris about that where it's partial where it should be where you have to connect to your sewer system because 600 feet would be very expensive for me to be required to connect to the sewer in the future um, where my my parcel will touch when the sewer does come there eventually mm -hmm. so that's my only concern and I, I asked him to address that portion and it's not in there Okay. Thanks. Thanks. Hello. So I have a similar question to Can his. You um, state your name. Jackie I know Larson. We know, but. I'm going to give you a different name one of these times and just see what happens. <laughs> um, so I don't know if it's kind of covered on this or not, but where my in laws are down below him in Leland, we have the sewer main that goes on the one side of our parcel, but the house is on the other road, a quarter mile away. So can we change it possibly kind of what he was saying to where it's maybe 300 feet within the home itself rather than parcel? Does that make sense? Yes. Are no, no. you following that? I'm not sure I'm following that. So it's kind of what. It's, yeah, it has 300 feet, but what if our house is a quarter mile away from the sewer? Okay. If it's They're parcel is right there. parcel is within 300 feet, but the then home the itself house is, is not. Yeah, okay. so can that be covered? Okay. So they're talking about item two on right. yeah, existing yeah. code. Yeah, that that actually comes from the state state law that if you're within 300 feet of a sewer, you're supposed to connect. Um, it's not something that we actively enforce, um, but it it is a requirement, and I don't know that we would ever force someone to connect, but we would charge them a base rate. So. 
if it, if it was in far front of their parcel. It is a good point, though, because a lot of the uh, properties that will come into the city, if they're not already in the community, into the city, they have long driveways that go back a ways for whatever reason with their property, and it does get pretty expensive to extend that sewer yeah. line. And if they are that, if they're on that large of a parcel, uh, I don't think that the, that the sewer system that they have with a septic tank would harm anyone. And so I can I can see where there needs to be some latitude there on distance to the house or to the septic system. Yeah, I think that's a good point. Um, I really that's probably why we don't actively enforce, enforce it. it. I think understand. that most people. I lived in Palmyra for a long time and had a septic tank and. If the sewer would have come down my street, I would have hooked onto it gladly. But I was only about 60 feet off of the road. Well, I was about 80 feet. But I would, you know, that would have been a no-brainer. Uh, septic tanks aren't the most pleasant things to maintain. So it's. But if I am purposefully, if I've located my house quite a ways away because I don't want the traffic, the noise, the whatever it might be. Uh, that'd be that'd be really hard to uh, come up with the kind of money that it would take to move that sewer line that far. For sure, and um, I think I'm not sure what you do about that if yeah, that's a, a I state, don't, especially law. where it's a state law requiring it. So even if we didn't have it in our code, it would still be required by the state. So um, we're just following their. But, but the state is requiring them to connect. It it does say to connect. Yes. Right. We just don't actively go out and why would we make people do it? So. And I don't know why we would. Yeah, you're. You know, that's one thing that you. You know, the state sometimes overreaches a little bit because if if you're not providing the service, I don't know how you can charge for it. And so they're saying, okay, well then you must hook up. Period. Mm -hmm. And I think that's. I think that it kind of goes against logic a little bit. But. Yeah, on these deeper lots, it's, it's definitely a hard situation. But maybe, maybe what we could do is ask staff and, and maybe uh, Joshua to take a look at the state code and see if there's room to accommodate the concerns we have, and and, and maybe uh, in their draft to city council, maybe it gets a. a Changed a little bit to alleviate some of these concerns. Is it throw it out thought there? Yeah, that's a good suggestion. I, I think we can relook at it with see if there's legal. In a lot of the state building code, uh, it will spell out things that are very specific, and the last thing that we'll say is or according to local administrative authority. That's true. And I know that that's always a pain in the butt because <laughs> <laughs> that opens a lot of doors. However, sometimes those doors need to be provided. Okay, I'm, I'm, I'm just needing to clarify. This is like plumbing for dummies. But so my question is: is so um, Jackie and Mr. Rasmussen, are you wanting it to be within? whatever it is for yours because you when it, the sewer comes out you want to connect oh you don't so you don't want to be compelled it's at the compelled to, to the oh okay thank you i think what and what jackie brought up was their parcel falls very close but the house itself and the septic system is Oh. Very far away, so we have even further to run it. That you would be forced to. Oh, okay. Gotcha. Okay. That this all makes a lot more sense to me now. Thank you. <laughs> makes sense. But everything else looks great. So, would it would it be more appropriate to come back to this body? With different language, or after a review, or to have a motion on this now, and have 
for that motion be for the staff to look into that prior to it being presented to City Council? Yeah, we, we, we can look into it and get back to this body. That's fine. I, I don't think. I, th I think it depends on. Or, or, or ask. It <laughs> depends on your level of we comfort. Can pass it and ask the staff. Sure. And city council to consider petitioning the state, yeah. or to look into what it would take to do. I guess that. my question was, do you have enough time to, to do that? To do a nothing. Road dive into that. There's enough time. Okay. Okay. So we're going to move to pass this as is, but then still look or. I can take a stab at it. We're going to entertain a motion and have to hear what that motion is. You want me to take a stab at it? Yes. I move the Planning Commission recommends approval of the sewage changes and the Planning Commission requests that staff and Mr. Nielsen and potentially whoever he delegates to do this on his team looks into the state law and whether or not there's room to accommodate local citizens option to connect or not depending on the uh, distance that might be grievous and economically an uh, economic hardship to do comply with and I'm trying to make this motion even longer <laughs> but I'm running out of words that's my motion second please <laughs> don't run out of words <laughs> we just hope that I have a motion and second pick that up um, all in favor? Aye. Aye. <laughs> I make a motion. We adjourn the meeting, which is the next item. Sorry, I jumped. I jumped the gun. This has been great. Let's keep the gun. We can, we can stay. <laughs> um, I was actually going to make a comment on that. I'm, I want to make sure that gets a review. I, I, I would have, I was more comfortable with that coming back for us. Um, just so I want to make sure that. I don't know, but for, for the city to compel people to be on that because they fall from that jurisdiction, uh, especially with the size of some of the lots in our county area, areas that have been county, that seems to be, I just don't like, I don't like that. Right. Um, so I hope that's done thoroughly and looked at, uh, I hope we push push a little bit on that. Um, and that's, that's my comments. So Mr. Chairman, I, I feel like I need to mention and to emphasize what Byron said and I'm usually just a fly on the wall when the question gets discussed about proximity mm -hmm. to sewer lines and that type of a thing if somebody is not developing their property we have not I understand that. People. I understand that but it's also like we talked about in that earlier uh, applicant where we're if, if it's stated I want to be clear with what's stated I don't I think ambiguity or leaving a trend to be followed, uh, I, I would prefer not to have that. I understand, I know the city is not going to want to compel that, but I, if that's the case, then why not make that as clear as possible in what we're writing in the Title 15? And not everyone's as nice as you, Dave. <laughs> I mean, 15 years from now, they may be forcing people to connect. So. I think the you main people are as nice as me. I, right? Amen, That's brother. Fine. I agree. Uh, this I'm is nowhere also near. not. I'm nowhere near. It's the benevolent government so. of Spanish Fork. I know. Yeah. I know. Anyway, the last item on our uh, agenda is to adjourn. So uh, moved. Do I have a motion to adjourn? Second. All in favor? Aye. 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 Thank you. Uh,